Hey everybody on YouTube, how y'all doing tonight? I am uh, just working. My computer's being a little bit of a jerk tonight. And so I'm just trying to get things fired up here uh, on my end because some reason, somehow, my computer is uh, not working well. And I, I'm trying to get a hold of the guests. I kept on sounding robotic on the radio side of things. And uh, we seem to be having a little bit of an issue here. So I'm trying to get things booted up here right now as we speak. And hopefully uh, we could get things going properly here. <clears throat> and uh, hopefully uh, we can make it work. Let's see what we can do here. All right. We are booted up. Just bear with me, everyone. And because uh, now we're on the clock. All right. Let's uh, go like this. And let's get this up and running. And let's get our. <coughs> I swear I'm getting allergic to pets and dander, man. I swear. Let's see if this works. Hello, Dave. How do I sound now to you? Perfect. Perfect. Rich and full bodied, okay. like a good cup of coffee. Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, let's uh, get this shit on the road here because we only got a couple of minutes Already. here. And, uh, yeah, I don't know why. All of a sudden, the last couple of nights, my computer wants me to reboot right before the show. And, right. And it sucks. It's I, the beginning of the AI takeover. <clears throat> yeah, I don't know what the hell it is, but it's getting annoying. That's for sure. It's getting annoying. Yeah, I bet it is. Yeah. So uh, we're working on it, though, and I think we're almost there, bud. I think we're almost there. All right. <clears throat> so let's go back here, fire this up. How you doing, YouTube? We are live. Robert J. Sawyer is our guest tonight, and we are having uh, going to be having a very, very good night. And uh, yeah, I, I don't have time to say hi to everyone tonight. I, you know, I love to do that to kick off the show. I'm just really uh, trying to get this organized so that way we can have a clean signal. And tomorrow I will be working on the computer to try and get this going. All right, we are about uh, two minutes away here, everyone, from making things happen here on the big show. And, uh, you know, I love each and every one of you and the way you support us on a nightly basis. So, you know what? We're going to have a good time tonight. We're going to have a very good time. I have no idea where we're going with tonight's conversation. This is my favorite type of show. And I can tell you right now, we got the guest to do this with Robert J. Sawyer. Yeah. Hey, Robert, how you doing, man? I'm doing well, Dave. How are you? I'll be good when we're uh, when I got all my screens open again, man, because I am like racing right now to open up everything. And it's like, ah, come on, let's do this. Let's do this thing. And it's like, OK, we got 90 seconds, but I think we're going to make it. I think we're going to make it because I'm almost there. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. So you're going to love tech problems right off the bat. But hey, if that's the worst thing that happens. Guess what? We're doing all right. We are doing all right. I'm ready. I am so ready right I'm now. I'm ready, too. Yeah. Good fellow Canadian kid here on the air, Robert J. Sawyer, out of Toronto, Mississauga, Ontario, where we broadcast on Saga 960 AM, which is good. You'll hear the show tomorrow night there. <clears throat> all right. Let's get this going. My throat is a little ratchy right now because uh, I think I I, I have the, my one couch because I have two dogs and a cat. And I think when I'm not home, they sleep on there. And when I go sit on the couch, it's like I'm inhaling the dander or something like that. And it's just starting to affect me. Never has before, but it's starting. 
So I don't know. I don't know. We're about uh, 45 seconds away, my friend. 45 seconds. I'm pumped up for this. I am very pumped up. Oh, yes. SFWriter.com. All right. Let's, uh, I'm ready for you now, man. I'm ready. Let me just have a little stretch here. I'm ready, here. too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll read an intro to the show, intro to you, and then uh, we will make that happen. Totally make that happen. <clears throat> All right. I'm going to send out the final tweet. We're going to connect live with our system here. And we got music on right now. <clears throat> Let's have a good show, everybody. We got one hell of a guest. And hopefully I'll get my voice back. Thank goodness for Fisherman's Friends. I don't think the Americans know what that is. <clears throat> Here we go. From the mountains of central British Columbia to you listening around the world, this, my friends, is Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. Good to be with you tonight as we welcome you to tonight's show on our terrestrial affiliates across North America and digitally on TalkStream Live and Revolution Radio. Now, if you want to take a listen to our archives, they are free at YouTube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Just do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Tonight's show is brought to you by Chive Charities. Help make the world 10% happier by visiting Chive Charities today. You can find them on our website. Robert James Sawyer is a Canadian science fiction writer. He has over 23 novels published, and his short fiction has appeared in Analog Science Fiction and Fact, Amazing Stories, On Spec, Nature, and many anthologies. The award-winning Sawyer is a member of the Order of Canada, the highest honor given by the country, and the Order of Ontario, the highest honor given by his province. He was also one of the initial inductees into the Canadian Science Fiction and Fantasy Hall of Fame. According to the U.S. trade journal Locus, Robert Bob is the number one all-time worldwide leader in the number of award wins as a science fiction or fantasy novelist. Man, are we lucky to have him. His website, sfwriter.com. Then at the bottom of hour number three, I will bring you the SOR Newswire brought to you by Paranoia Magazine. Mr. Robert J. Sawyer, what a pleasure to have you on Spaced Out Radio tonight. How are you? Dave, I'm just fine. Thank you. It's midnight here in Toronto, and Mississauga is a suburb, as you well know, and I am doing absolutely fine. I'm so pleased to be on your show. Well, I'm so glad because Saga 960 in Mississauga, Ontario, is our first Canadian affiliate that we have, and I'm very excited to be Ter broadcasting there at night. Terrific station. Terrific station. I'm so pleased. Me too. Me too. R Robert, I got to ask you, I mean... It takes one heck of an imagination to go where anybody goes in science fiction. We've seen it all around from from George Lucas and the Star Wars uh, business and empire, if we could call it that, no pun intended, to everyday writers who are publishing their own blogs. What is it about imagination, my friend, that really, really captivates a movie a book, a novel, a docu-series, a television show, because this is something we love to have and love to do. Yeah, absolutely. And it has become really the cornerstone of our popular culture, hasn't it? Uh, and the, the answer is, I think it's simple. There is enough real life drama in everybody's real life these days that we don't need to turn to a novel or a TV show, or go to a movie to see the mundane sort of misery uh, that most of us have to contend with, whether it's uh, with work, whether it's, of course, with the COVID-19 crisis, whether it's with economic difficulties that many people are facing these days. I hate to use the word escapism because sometimes that is uh, pejorative, but the notion of getting out of this reality and getting a glimpse 
hopes that maybe there's a better reality, hopefully somewhere down the pike, I think is one of the things that helps us to keep going. It's that light at the end of the tunnel that keeps us going on from day to day. Okay, well, let's learn a little bit about you here, my friend, because, you know, this has been a huge part of your life where you've allowed your imagination to run wild and come up with different themes, mysteries, topics, adventures. How did you get started in this? Well, as you mentioned, you're in Canada, I'm in Canada. I was born in 1960, and we in Ontario, unique among North American jurisdictions, we had a grade 13 at the time that I was going to high school. So I graduated high school at 19 years old, 1979, and I wanted to be a scientist, not a science fiction writer. I was accepted to study paleontology. I wanted to study dinosaurs professionally, uh, paleontology at the University of Toronto, Excellent program there. And what I came to understand very quickly was back then, it's changed and so much for the better, but back then the chances of being a world-class scientist in Canada were very slim. And my sort of hobby, I always thought, would be, well, you know, I'll dabble in writing science fiction. Nobody had ever tested whether you could be a full-time science fiction writer in Canada. It simply had not been done by 1979. And I thought, what the heck? Even though 19 is a year late by most people's standards to be graduating from high school, I still thought, I'm a young person. If I try this and fail, I can always go back and, and try to become some sort of scientist in this country. But I thought, I'll give this a shot. And I am so glad that I did. It worked out. And I had an enormous amount of luck. A lot of determination, a little bit of talent, but most of all, I've been very, very lucky, and I acknowledge that right off the bat. And I also say, of course, any Canadians and anybody in the United States or elsewhere listening, the world has changed. When I was starting in 1979 to embark on a career, there were no world-class science jobs for anybody in Canada. There were very few world-class science jobs for women or people of color anywhere in uh, North America, all of that has changed now. And I think, had I been born in a different decade, maybe I would have ended up being that dinosaur specialist instead of somebody who wrote science fiction. Now, do you regret your decision? Or do you love the Not fact that you have the ability to to really play off whatever your your imagination or wherever it takes you for that point? Well, first, of course, as a science fiction writer, I know all about the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics that tells us that for any decision that could have gone multiple ways, it did go multiple ways, just in different world lines. So there is a version of reality where somehow I did become a successful uh, vertebrate paleontologist. And a very good friend of mine, is Phil Curry. Phil Curry is Canada's best-known dinosaurian paleontologist. Uh, he used to be at the Royal Turrell Museum of Paleontology in Drumheller, Alberta, and now he's head of the paleobiology department at the University of uh, Alberta in Edmonton. World famous for his work, particularly in Alberta and also in China, on theropod dinosaurs and on feathered dinosaurs and their relationship to birds. Well, Phil, when he was growing up in Toronto, wanted to be a science fiction writer. Now, he's a decade older than me. And when he looked at it, he said, no way, I got to find an honest job. So Phil became the science the scientist, and I became the science fiction writer, but we've become great friends, and we both acknowledge that in a different timeline, I'm him, and he's me. But you know what? He actually likes working out in the hot Alberta sun or the hot sun of China, where he's done a lot of expeditionary work. And uh, I melt and wilt in the hot sun. I think somehow we ended up in the best of all possible worlds for us individually. Well, I mean, that's kind of cool because you don't hear much about that. It's almost like you guys were transplanted into one another. 
It's really cool. He's a super guy. And, you know, he was a very serious science fiction fan. He was really, uh, and still is, I, I shouldn't discount this, he's just not as active as he was, uh, but an expert on Edgar Rice Burroughs. And not, you know, most people think of Burroughs, the first thing they think of is Tarzan. And certainly Phil knows all about Tarzan. But tar uh, uh, Burroughs also wrote about Mars. Uh, there was a movie, not a very good one, or oh, a decade or so, ago called John Carter, which was based on the Edgar Rice Burroughs Mars stories. But uh, Phil is a world-class expert on the science fiction of Edgar Rice Burroughs. And I like to think I'm not a world-class expert by any means, but as lay people go, I'm pretty sophisticated in my knowledge and understanding of dinosaurian paleontology. So much so that I have many friends who are professional paleontologists who talk to me, at least on, a, on an equal footing. Okay, so so when you go down this road and you let your imagination run wild in the sci-fi era, like a lot of us would love to do, how do you come up with your ideas? So that's a very good question. And everybody likes to think that somehow an idea kind of pops into your head full blown. And it just never happens that way. It's like any creative thing. It's really hard work. But I'm what I like to term a thematic writer. The very first thing I do is I pick a topic. So for my novel, my current novel is the Oppenheimer Alternative. It's a bit of an aberration because it's an alternate history novel. My previous one was called Quantum Night. And that my topic was the science of evil. A lot of people had said because my previous, at that point, 22 novels were awfully upbeat and optimistic. I'm very much of that Star Trek 1960s, uh, uh, you know, sunny future days lie ahead mentality. Uh, they said, you know, Rob, that's great. I love your stories, but aren't you a little bit Pollyanna-ish? Aren't you maybe a trifle naive about human nature? Uh, you know, there are a lot of bad people and bad things. And I said to myself, okay, let's research this topic, the science of evil. And that's all I went in with. And then after spending about a year researching it. The first thing you find, of course, when you do any research these days, you go to Google. So I put the science of evil into Google. What shows up immediately? Psychopathy, the study of psychopaths. And Stanley Milgram, who did the famous obedience to authority, the shock machine experiments that anybody who's ever taken a psychology course has heard about, where he asked people to keep administering successively higher electric shocks uh, higher voltage electric shocks to people, um, even when the people were screaming, even when people said they had a heart condition, as long as the authority figure said, no, no, it's all right, go ahead, keep cranking it up, people would do it. And then there was Philip Zimbardo a decade later who did his research, the Stanford Prison Guard experiment, where he took Students at Stanford, one of the top universities in the United States, the best of the best, the academic creme de la creme, and divided them arbitrarily into prisoners and prison guards. And suddenly the prison guards became bestial, beating and berating and humiliating the prisoners uh, just because they were role playing the part and they couldn't break out of it. So I learned that human nature is very malleable and easily made into a very corrupt form. And from that, you get the idea. And the idea is simple. The My theme was the uh, most pernicious lie the human race had ever told itself was that you cannot change human nature. Changes all the time. Adolf Hitler was the great architect of changing entire nation's character. And then when we talk about changing human nature figuratively, in science fiction, your story generating engine is very off and you take something that we usually think of as only figurative and I made it literal and literally at the quantum mechanical level change the nature of human consciousness in that novel. So it's a big sweeping novel about experimental psychology and about the, uh, the nature of how it is that people end up committing evil acts against what they think of as their own 
to use the term from uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln that Stephen Pinker has adopted, the better angels of their nature. But you end up with a concrete idea and a plot out of that. It comes from the research, going in with an open mind and not knowing in advance what to think about a topic until you really understand the topic in depth. Robert J. Sawyer is our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio. We're talking sci-fi all night long. Robert, as you have gone down this road and, and you've seen what others have done, more some people who have been more successful, those have been less successful with their ideas, what takes someone to the top like where you are in your game comparatively to, say, a first-time novelist or, or just somebody who struggles at writing a number of books? So you say a number right off the bat. I think the most important thing is quality, not quantity. We've got, you know, a friend of mine who has well over a hundred books once quipped at a writer's conference. I can understand a guy who writes only one book a year. What I don't understand is what he does with the other nine months. And my wife quipped, polish his awards. It's easy to produce a lot of quantity, but the books that stick with people are the quality novels. You know, we think of Isaac Asimov as a great science fiction writer, and if you look at his bio, go to Wikipedia, you'll see that over 400 books have his byline on them, but only a couple of dozen out of a career that lasted 60-odd years were science fiction books. And only a few of those, the Foundation Trilogy, his robot novels and his robot short stories, and one standalone novel uh, that won the Hugo Award, um, are remembered at all these days. The quality will out. So whenever I say to a first-timer, somebody's trying to break in, write the best book you're possibly capable of. Don't say, well, here's how low the bar is to get published. Say, here is the highest bar that I'm capable of vaulting over and try to knock people's socks off. Because like anything in life, Dave, you only get one chance at making a first impression. Very true. But how do you know if you have a winner or not? Because people are well, fickle. Well, this is an people, interesting people thing. Fickle, now, when I was, oh, Absolutely. And publishers are shy uh, and economically conservative. So if you do something that's out of the box, it's really hard to get a publisher to say, you know, what a publisher wants, we call them comps in the industry, which is short for comparable titles. They want to be able to say, this book is for fans of that book. If you like author X, you'll like this. Or the mashup. This is X meets Y. This is Westworld meets, um, uh, you know, uh, this Stephen King's The Shining or what have you, right? And if you do something that isn't easily compartmentalizable, it's very hard to get a publisher to give a real push behind it. But you look at, you know, you talk about writers more successful than me. Well, we've got one in your province. We've got my friend William Gibson, who is the father of cyberpunk, whose novel Neuromancer will be remembered as one of the great novels, not just great science fiction novels, but one of the great novels of the 20th century. And it was his first novel. And he set out to do something that essentially nobody had ever done before. And he was writing this. Remember, that book came out in 1984 before any of us had experienced virtual reality or multiple, massively multi-user online role-playing games or immersive online experience. He said, I'm going to figure out what that's going to be like and portray it for people before it really exists. And he worked really hard, and it paid off. Uh, it will. The, the truth of the matter is it will always be his best-known novel, that first one. But he did enter by knocking people's socks off. Well, I, I want to ask you this, because we're going to get more into the AI and, and aliens and all sorts of sci-fi stuff coming up here as we got you for just over another two hours here on the show. But, but I'm curious... 
How has, you know, with you making a, a career of this, which very few people can be successful at, and, I, and, you know, I don't know your financial position, it's none of my business or anything along those lines, but obviously this is your career path that you chose. There are so many people out there now who, who are writing books, and thanks to, to self-publishing like Amazon and, and others, to me it's really taken the that that specialty of writing and being able to blend and romanticize words together to to put a good book together because now everybody and their dog can do it and in fact some dogs are publishing yes. so how has that affected what you do and have you noticed your own sales go down as a result of this or the new generation of people they're not picking up books they want to do everything online and on tablets that's right. So, uh, you know, it's funny. My editor years ago at Tor, which is the largest English, English language science fiction publisher, division of Macmillan, one of the big five New York publishing houses, uh, said to me, I, he said to me, I think, my editor, meaning I, that the days of the full-time science fiction writer are numbered. And I said, his name was David as well, David Hartwell. I said to him, Dave, I think the days of the full-time science fiction editor are numbered because I saw the future, which was that disintermediation is the term we use, the middleman or the middle person, the traditional publisher, the traditional editor will indeed fall by the wayside. And what we have seen with uh, YouTube, the medium through which most people are taking in this show right now, is a perfect example. Nobody requires an agent to get a shot at possibly putting something up, maybe on YouTube, you just go ahead and do it. And if enough people like it, you're a success. It's as simple as that. Mm -hmm. So what I did very, I'd like to think, cannily or savvily with my most recent novel, The Oppenheimer Alternative, is I said to my print publishers, I have two separate ones, one in Canada, one in the United States, both very respected. I said to them, you can have the print rights, but I am retaining the ebook and the audiobook rights, which is very unusual in a modern publishing arrangement. Print publishers consider those to be deal breakers, that you have to give them those rights because they recognize that they are a substantial income source. And I'm convinced that they will be, they, if they aren't already, will be very soon the principal income source. There's no point in telling somebody to put down their tablet or their phone and go and to pick up a dead tree product. That's a paradigm that makes no sense. But if you tell them, you know, there's an app on which you can read my book, whether it's the Kindle app or the Kobo app or the Nook app or the iBooks app, I don't care. Read it on whichever one you want. And you like to hear a book instead of read a book, you got your Audible app or you've got your iTunes app or whoever's app you use. That's perfectly fine too. I really do think that you're exactly right. The taking out of the middle people and going directly from my brain to your device is the absolute future and pretty much the present as well of publishing. Is that good for the field? Is it good for the reader? Is it good as we got about a minute? Is it good for anybody though? It is good for those of us who do things that are not easily categorizable. It is bad for the writers who were formulaic in the extreme. Now, that said, most of what's online is formulaic. So there's an awful lot of I was going to use a bad word and we're on the radio here, but there's an awful lot of less than stellar material floating out there because anybody can upload. But there's a lot of really bad stuff on YouTube, too, right? You just ignore it. It There is a process that we've seen where the crowd will find the good stuff. Stuff goes viral. Stuff is promoted. Likes and online reviews and all that sort of thing do matter. So, yeah, I think it is good. Ultimately, it is very good. And in terms of economics, I make way more when you buy one of my ebooks for uh, the current price is I think six ninety nine US for my new ebook than I do if you buy the twenty two ninety five trade paperback of the book. Exactly. 
Robert, I'm going to get you to hold on here because we are going to go to break at the bottom of the hour. Author Robert J. Sawyer is our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio, award-winning sci-fi novelist. Let's get into a little bit of aliens with him because, you know, you can't have a sci-fi conversation without throwing in a few aliens. We'll be back right after this on Spaced Out Radio. Good chat so far, my friend. Good chat. Excellent. Thank you so much. I'm going to take a little washroom break, and I'll be back. In yeah, you go, man. Before we're back. Yeah. All uh, right. It's cool. Perfect. Dalbro, where have you been hiding, man? <laughs> yeah, the hair is growing long quickly, too. Tina's cheering on the break time. She's like, oh, break time, break time. We can, Dave will shut up. Yeah, break time. I'm teasing. Mm hmm. Oh, Corin's the booking guy. Weird. Uh, I think my hair is uh, taken over from Dolan's, man. Just saying. I think I've surpassed him. Hey, Paul, how you doing, man? Welcome to our chat room. Really appreciate that. Hey, Super Roy, you got your cape on tonight? Hey, Daniel, I just cut off uh, 15 inches of hair, man. Hi, Susan. I had a, uh, a sandwich for lunch today. And it was in all, not whole wheat, but it had like all the seeds and stuff in there. I swear to God, like I have like four seeds in the bottom of my teeth and I've been like flossing all day and I can't get the shit out. It's driving me nuts. <laughs> Boy, Davey, you just uh, punched that one right out of the park. Hey, Noble Patrick. I feel like I should bow to you. There you go. All right. Robert, are you back? I certainly am. Wonderful. Me too, man. Well, I, I didn't really leave. <laughs> All right. We've got about 90 seconds, man. 90 seconds. I've cool. just been chatting with the YouTube pe people here. Uh, Dave. So I, I gathered. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Apparently I need a water pick. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. For my teeth. Yeah. Hey, Jurassic Joey. Welcome. All right. All right. We ask each guest two questions, my friend. Two questions. 
the audience. They'll be pissed off because you're a new guest if I don't ask these. And uh, and uh, my my fans are weird sometimes like this. But number one, you know, what, what's your opinion of eating breakfast meals for dinner? Actually, I am a fan of that. Uh, I am perfectly content if people do that. Now, I happen to be a low-carb dieter, uh, which means that bacon or eggs any time of the day is absolutely mm. perfectly fine. Mm. Now, I understand a lot of good vegan people out there, too. Uh, I'm actually not sure that I want to eat any of that stuff at any time of the day. I know. But uh, the normal breakfast food works just fine. And I'm a big fan of, uh, uh, we don't have to name the particular chains, we all know them, but the places that serve breakfast 24 hours a day, yeah. as well as you know the usual yeah. hamburger and, and uh, that kind of thing. I yeah. got to cut you off there on because we're about to come back. Radio.com. Okay. Oh. All right. Yeah. I'm anti-breakfast for dinner, just so you know. <laughs> my, 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 my listeners, they, they rub it in all the time. Rub it in. All right, here we go. Music's on. <clears throat> Welcome back to the second half hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott, hanging out with all of you. Thank you so much for tuning us in. Reminder that if you have missed portions of this show or others, you can check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Just do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, as well as on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. Tonight we are talking with award-winning author Robert J. Sawyer. He is one of the top sci-fi writers in the world. He enjoys breakfast for dinner, which I find a little bit disappointing, but we're going to let it go this time. His website, sfwriter.com. And Robert, welcome back, my friend. Thank you so much, Dave. I'm glad to be here. Breakfast for dinner. You know, I thought, you know, but you are an East Coaster. I mean, that doesn't surprise me. <laughs> well, you know, as uh, I'm a low-carb dieter, the standard ideal breakfast food is an egg, and that is the perfect low-carb ketogenic diet item. And everybody likes a little bacon now and then. Mm, well, true. it's perfectly good at dinner, too. As I'm going to take a sip of my Dairy Queen uh, strawberry shake that's in my hand right now, you're making me feel guilty by saying that. We better switch over to aliens here pretty darn quick, because <laughs> you can't have a sci-fi talk with aliens. Uh, I'm sure you, because of the genre you were in, have been paying close attention to all of this UFO stuff that has been going on here across North America and especially in the United States where the majority of our listeners are. What's your take on everything about this whole UFO movement? Well, there's an uptick, of course, in the last several months, in large measure, I think, for two reasons. One is people have a lot more spare time on their hands. They're outdoors and they're outdoors at night in that they don't have to get up for their, you know, their job anymore, unfortunately, in a lot of cases. And a great number of people turn their eyes towards the sky for the first time in a long time because of um, uh Comet Neil wise, they wanted to get a look at this in a once in a lifetime comet. So I don't think whether or not aliens are visiting us, whether or not UFOs are alien spaceships, I don't think there's been an uptick in the occurrence. The frequency, let's say, of visitations, if that's what's going on. But there certainly have been enough more people looking. And if you look more, you find more. And I think that is a very straightforward explanation for why during this COVID crisis, we're seeing uh, you know more of this sort of thing. It's the same thing in World War II. You know, the flying saucers, uh, that's a, a term that comes from just after 19, at the end of World War II. And Foo Fighters, which were these things that seemed to trail behind uh, fighter planes during World War II, uh, people were looking up in the sky way more at that time. They, in those cases, were afraid of bombs instead of looking for a beautiful comet. But the more you look up, the more you're going to see. Okay, and that's a pretty rational answer. But, you know, with the hype around UFOs right now and you doing what you do, 
you know, there's a lot of people coming out of the woodwork saying, you know, I've seen a UFO or I've seen some strange anomalies in the sky or lights hovering over. I thought it was a helicopter and it turned out not to be, you know, then you get the crowd out there who, you know, they like their aliens. I mean, let's just be honest, you know, little gray dudes running around, you know, I mean, is this. Is this time, you know, during the COVID time, just a, a whole point for us to stretch our imaginations to what possibly could be? Well, you know, uh, people often ask me what's my favorite science fiction film. And I used to say 2001, but uh, A Space Odyssey from 1968. But it's built on this paranoid notion that if we ever discovered, we meaning a government, ever discovered evidence that extraterrestrials existed, we would have to keep it a deathly secret from the public. That's the whole premise of 2001, that the discovery of a monolith on the moon that was planted there four million years ago, in other words, it's no threat to anybody today, had to be kept a a deep, dark secret, so much so that even the two astronauts aboard Discovery, the spaceship, who weren't in hibernation, the four were in hibernation and two were not, didn't even know why they were going on the space voyage. They hadn't been briefed that aliens had, uh, evidence of aliens had been discovered. These days, you ask the average person, look at any poll, it doesn't matter who it is, whether it's Pew or any other organization that's doing it, you'll find that the majority of North Americans, of Western Europeans as well, believe that aliens exist, think it's highly probable, uh, if not absolutely definitely true, that they already have visited Earth and um, are visiting us now. There's no reason anymore to keep this stuff secret. Maybe there was, you know, somehow during the Cold War where there was just so much paranoia and everything was classified as secret almost as default. But now, yeah, I think, you know, it's time if the government has information, come clean. And you won't see panic in the streets. You won't see mass riots. When the government finally says, or if we see that the SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, has contacted an alien civilization through radio astronomy, and the headline in the New York Times and the Toronto Star and the Vancouver province is aliens discovered, people will say, yeah, well, what else is new? Right. We knew all along for sure. It's not a game changer anymore for human psychology. We're totally ready. You, you honestly believe people are ready. I mean, dude, we're talking about people. I do. We're talking about people who hoarded toilet paper over a, oh, yeah. a virus. I mean, I'm not worried about anything coming to us from Uranus, <laughs> but you got to look after Uranus in a in a time of uh, of scarcity. No, I understand what you're saying for sure. I mean, the thing is, if we come clean at this point, suppose that UFOs, flying saucers, alien, little green guys, little gray guys, however you want to define it. Have as the government says, they're here and they've been visiting us. All they can say is they've been visiting us since time immemorial, since you know these sorts of sightings go back forever. Then okay, they're here. It's like the huge discovery that there was a microbiome, right? That there are more bacteria and even orders of magnitude more viruses living inside the physical skin that constrains the outlines of your body, then there are bodily cells that make up you. And you go, oh, huh, well, that's kind of interesting. There's more that isn't me than is me inside this sack of skin. But it doesn't make you panic. You just live with the fact. And the people say, okay, what probiotics should I take to make sure that the good stuff flourishes within me and the bad stuff goes away? Okay, so... Outside of that, there has been talk, and we if we go down the sci-fi realm here, there's been talk that if aliens all of a sudden showed up or, or the government stated that extraterrestrials are real, all right, and it came out to the public, there is talk that this is going to have major impact on everything in this world, from, from the way people live their lives to, to their employment to 
to uh, a collapse of the economy, to countries going to war, religions fighting as well. Like this could be the start of something very, very brutal on this planet. Do you think that is just looking into things way too, too much? Or do you believe that people have a higher sense of what is going on? I think, A, we have a higher sense, but B, you're absolutely right, there'll be some game changers. It depends exactly what we find. Now, for instance, I would not be the least bit surprised that we find in the next one, two, three, or four Mars probes that there is microbe, microbial life still extant on Mars. Would it surprise me in the least? Will that change anybody's religion or cause anybody to go? No. What we're talking about is if intelligent aliens get in touch with us or come here, how would that change us? It would only change us if, for instance, and if you're looking for a, you know, a reason why governments might keep this secret, suppose aliens came along and said, here's the ultimate power source, right? Here's clean, cold fusion. It works flawlessly or dilithium crystals from Star Trek or whatever you want. Forget about your oil and gas-based economy. Forget about the current world order where certain countries are the haves and certain countries are the have-nots. That just all disappears with unlimited free energy available to everybody, right? So there are vested interests, just as there are today, vested interests in traditional energy sector industries who do everything they can to discredit renewable energy sector industries. There's no question that that sort of thing uh, might cause a lot of destabilization. But you know what? Industries come and go. Over the years, there's uh, it used to be that the majority of the American public was engaged in farming and now far fewer than 5% of the population is engaged in food production of any type. Well, that that's uh, that was uh, been a shift over time, though. Okay, I mean, you go. Oh yeah, and it'll be a wrap. That's right. It will be a shock to the system. But what are you going to do? Shocks to the system happened. COVID-19 was a shock to the system. World War II was a shock to the system. The atomic bomb, what I write about in my current novel, The Oppenheimer Alternative, a shock to the system. Uh, you know, we're resilient. We're human beings. Well, the reason we are here now is because we've survived every previous shock to the system that nature and our own perfidious uh, character has uh, thrown at us in the past. So do you think we're sophisticated enough? There's a lot of places on Earth that are still partying like it's 1499. Yeah, you know, that's a very interesting question. I mean, there used to be a kind of a science fictional trope where people would pretend that aliens were invading Earth. There was a, an Outer Limits episode. Robert Culp is the uh, star of it, for instance. Pretend that aliens are invading. Fake up an alien invasion. Why? So all the warring countries of Earth would come together united against a common enemy. Well, the reality is COVID-19 is that in the real world. It's a common enemy. It doesn't care what country you live in. It doesn't discriminate between, you know, rich or poor or blah, blah, blah. It just kills or makes sick or, de uh, or destabilizes an economy. And the sad truth is it didn't bring us all together. The difference between where you are in Vancouver and a hundred miles south in Seattle, Washington, is night and day between the way the two countries are handling this absolutely, this threat, this virus that has absolutely no knowledge of the 49th parallel or of a border between those two nations. Mm hmm. Well, you know what? Apparently it's it's stopping it, though. At least we hope. But that's another that's another. let us hope, you know, I mean, but it, even if it does, this is COVID-19 named for the year 2019. Even if this one does stop, we're not done with plagues and viruses oh, and no. so forth. There'll be another one. Oh, yeah. um, I mean, we got to think positive, and, right? 
<laughs> we have to tackle the fundamental issue. We need an antiviral that's as, as effective as our antibiotics are. Uh, we never invented an antibiotic, remember. We discovered it. Penicillin was a discovery, an accidental one. Uh, and it works very broadly against all kinds of bacteria. We need something that works very broadly against all kinds of viruses instead of what we have now, which is uh, vaccinations that are aimed at one and only one very narrow strain. That's why our flu shots are only about 60% effective. Six times out of 10, which is, you know, Better than batting 500 in baseball, six times out of 10, our best epidemiologists guess correctly which strain of flu will become dominant this particular winter and come up with the, the right vaccination in time. And four times out of 10, eh, we missed the mark. It was a slightly different one, and our vaccine didn't do us any darn good. Oh, we need a nice. general antiviral. We need a Manhattan Project of genetic science or virology that will tackle that issue because otherwise we'll just keep facing the same enemy over and over again in different guises and still using the same tools we used 102 years ago with the flu pandemic of 1918, hoping for a vaccine hoping for herd immunity, hoping it'll die out on its own, hoping it'll mutate into a non-infectious form. We shouldn't be fighting a war in 2020 with things that predate even the roaring 20s of the last century. Robert J. Sawyer is our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio. One of your books is called Hybrids. All right. Now, mm -hmm. along here, when we talk about hybrids, we talk about aliens interbreeding or taking the semen from men and uh, fertile eggs from women to try and build these that hybrids. That would be the right order. Yes. <laughs> you know, yes. Do you think this phenomenon so, yeah, is actually hybrids, going on? Level hybrids is about hybridization, not between humans and aliens, but between two different kinds of human beings, Homo sapiens sapiens, that is you and me and everybody who's listening, and Homo neanderthalensis, which were our burly brow-ridged cousins that in this version of reality have been extinct for probably around 40,000 years. In a hybrids, there's an alternate reality where they survive to the present day, and they have different characteristics than what we have. Mm -hmm. And there's a desire to see what the best of both worlds would be through hybridization. But yeah, absolutely, this idea that we might become a chimera, is the word that they use in biological science, taking it from Greek mythology, a being that has part one characteristic and part another characteristic. It's going to happen, whether it happens with extraterrestrials or whether it happens with genetic modification in the laboratory, if it happens with a mad scientist crossbreeding us with chimpanzees. It's going to happen for sure. Well, and the reason why I asked is I knew that's what your book was about. I was just going to say that we talk a lot about hybridization around here, and whether or not people are being used. You know, when you look into the alien phenomena from a sci-fi level or even with what you uh, just described about your book, Hybrids, do you think that this is genetically possible, that this is actually going on behind the scenes or up in the stars or in some deep cavern of a government laboratory? Well, this is the unfortunate thing about almost all cutting-edge science research of the last, let's say, three, if not four decades. Almost all of it goes on behind secret walls. Either they're the secret walls that are big corporations, the cutting-edge research in computer science and cryptography in quantum physics related to quantum computing goes on under NDAs, non-disclosure agreements, not published in peer-reviewed journals at places like Google and Apple and Microsoft. And the leading research in bio technology goes on at companies uh, that are some of them are publicly traded and some of them are not yet, but are all happening without us really knowing what's going on. So you betcha there are all kinds of things that if you just look at what's happening publicly on our university campuses, uh, you're way out of touch with what's really going on behind the scenes at our cutting edge science facilities. And some of it 
would pass ethical muster, but a great deal of it certainly would not. Okay. Do you think it's going on today, though? I mean, we hear so many of these stories, you know, about the hybridization with aliens or MK Ultra or these military laboratories that are that are hidden in in groups where they are stealing people and doing all of these weird tests and remote viewing and and oh my goodness, I'm just uh, I'm I'm rambling here because there's so much allegedly going on. You coming from that type of land of woo. I mean, do you, do you actually buy into that, or do you have to have a, a sense of causation here? I have to have a sense of causation. The most skeptical guys in the world and gals are science fiction writers. We're always saying, show me the evidence. Show me the proof. Make this make sense to me. Uh, you know, we were the ones who, as soon as George Lucas introduced the Force, as a fantasy concept, it's, you know, the ancient religion, as Darth, uh, uh, as people said to Darth Vader, and then were quickly choked for saying it, we were perfectly happy. It's a fantasy notion. We could follow it. As soon as he said, well, it's midichlorians, and it's this kind of science behind it, we said, come on, George. It doesn't make any damn sense, and you know it doesn't make any damn sense. Just go with it as a comic book idea, and we'll follow you along. But if you want to gussy it up and present it as being somehow plausible, then we're going to bring all of our skeptical faculties to bear on it and say, nah, not so much. It doesn't pass the smell test. Apparently it did, though, with the fans. Well, you know, the midi-chlorians came around after the original three films. And as a lot of fans will tell you, especially classic fans of your era and mine, those first three films, which are now classified as the fourth, fifth, and sixth, A New Hope, Empire Strikes Back, and Return of the Jedi, are the only three Star Wars films worth thinking about. The less said about the films with the midi-chlorians and Jar Jar Binks, the better. You know what? I do have to agree with you there. You, <laughs> you bet. You, you know what drove me nuts? Uh, totally off topic about this, but you know what drove me nuts about the, the when they started redoing all the Star Wars was all the CGI. Because back in the yes. day, it was all done by hand. It was all done by hand, and and it looked more realistic. You know what? You know what I'm saying? I totally agree. And. You know, what's interesting is on the uh, Mandalorian, which is the Star Wars Universe TV series, the guys in charge of the baby of the species that they call Baby Yoda, but it isn't the character Yoda, but the baby character who is of the same species as Yoda were adamant. It's got to be a puppet. It can't be CGI. And what the world has learned again, or what, uh, sorry, Lucasfilm, now part of Disney, has learned is something they had forgotten when George Lucas was in charge, which is absolutely, we would much rather see Frank Oz doing a Muppet, which is what he did for Yoda, than to see CGI. We'd much rather see Kenny Baker in a tin can as R2-D2 than see a CGI robot. I know, I know, and I, and I is it just Hollywood's love for the fact that they want to use all of this computer technology so it stays really up to date? I think it's total and complete control. Hollywood went awry. We can argue this with any film study studies a professor or, or student, but in the nineteen. 50s, when the auteur school, auteur being the French word for author, when the notion that one guy, the director, was the creative genius and should have total control. And I think that's what Lucas was looking for. He thought, I got an okay performance out of Frank Oz, a not bad performance out of Anthony Daniels, who played C-3PO. It took me two guys, David Prowse for the body and James Earl Jones for the voice, to get a Darth Vader. What if I could control every single pixel of those characters and have them do precisely and exactly what and only what I want them to do. And I really think it was the megalomania that said, take the humans out of the equation and make it something that I can endlessly tweak until I'm 
absolutely satisfied. And anybody who's ever gone to a live hockey game or a live theatrical performance knows that half the fun is knowing that it is imperfect beings who are performing for you. That is very true. That's very true. Especially when it's abandoned, they miss that note or they sing the wrong lyrics. And you're like, no. That's right. And you love them even more for that. Yeah, exactly. You, you cringe, but you will remember 20 years, 40 years later, you say, I'm there when so-and-so the hockey player missed the the free and clear shot on goal. I was there when, uh, you know, Paul Simon's voice broke during the oh, Central yes. Park concert and he hit miss hit it. I, you know, these are the things you'll remember way more than, oh, yeah, I went there and it was absolutely perfect. A machine couldn't have done it better, right? Yes, or Axl Rose, Miss Singing, Sweet Child of Mine in Vancouver in 2016. I was there. I saw it happen. Hey, Robert, you, are. You, exactly. you hold on because we're going to go to break here at the top of the hour. Author Robert J. Sawyer continues the sci-fi talk on Spaced Out Radio with Hour 2 coming up right after this. All right, man. I'm just going to run my dogs outside. I'll be right back, okay? I'll be back, too. Cheers. <coughs> Hey, space travelers, this is John Resig, founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. If you know anything about our website, you know we like to do things a little differently. We're not some faceless organization collecting money for a nebulous cause. Our donor dollars go directly toward life-improving items. Then we give those items directly to an underdog who needs it most. To become a donor with Spaced Out Radio's official charity, Chive Charities, just go to chivecharities.org forward slash donate. The SOR Vault is open for business, and do we have some cool swag for you to pick up. All you have to do is head over to our website and click on the SOR Vault. You have a variety of cool logos to choose from, and put them on anything you want. T-shirts, hoodies, hats, coffee mugs, you name it, we can get it to you. So do your shopping by supporting the store you love. Get your Spaced Out Radio swag at the SOR Vault today. We are scouring the world for the most intriguing stories of your day. Take the time to read up on the SOR Newswire, where our team, led by Captain Shirk, will deliver to you some of the best paranormal and supernatural news, along with some stories that will blow your mind from the weird to the wacky. It's the news outside the news that piques interest, and that's what we're looking to deliver to you. The SOR Newswire, only at spacedoutradio.com. This is Amber Beckrude, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel where we store all of the SOR show archives for free. And as an added bonus, every two weeks, I'm posting brand new content on Cryptid Tales, where I will get into some of the spookier legends and folklore from around the world and tell the stories that go with them. Find us at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio and check out Cryptid Tales today. Drop a comment and let me know what you want to hear. See you there. Hi there, this is the paranormal lawyer, Michael W. Hall. I'd like to invite you to listen in each Sunday night where we're going to open up your eyes to everything strange and paranormal. I will be hosting some great guests with topics that affect us all, such as UFOs, ghosts, and everything paranormal. Let's learn together on Spaced Out Radio Sunday with myself, Michael W. Hall, the paranormal lawyer at spacedoutradio.com. Get your horns up with me on Spaced Out Radio. This is Ron Bumblefoot Thaw. Come tune in to SOR where you can hear me rock out with Little Brother is Watching, the official theme song right, of Spaced Out Radio. And then come on over to bumblefoot.com. <coughs> All right. No, I didn't go get another strawberry shake. One's enough. All right. How we all doing, YouTube? 
Good to have you all here tonight. Some new faces, familiar faces. Thank you for coming on in. Make sure you hit that subscribe button and that little bell thingy that tells you when we're going to come on. We would appreciate that. Thank you. How you doing, my friend? Robert, we got about uh, two minutes left. Oh, I'm, I'm fine. Absolutely. I'm sorry. I thought you were talking to a YouTuber. Oh, no. That's, uh, that's perfect. Right. Oh, good. You having fun? I'm absolutely fine. I've got my drink, which is a Diet Pepsi, and uh, I'm all set to go. Are you having fun? Oh, very much so. Yes, absolutely, Dave. I'm having a blast. Thank you so much for having me on. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I know Carmen's listening in, so thank you, Carmen. Great guest. Yeah. Oh, Carmen is the best, and we do have to make sure we give uh, good coverage to uh, writers of the future. Carmen, after all, works for them, not for me. Yes. Yes, uh, we are uh, about to get into that a little bit. Good. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Hey, Gnome, good to have you back in the chat room. Thank you for coming on in, hey, Cookie. Thank you for joining us. All right, we got about minute 10. <laughs> Shouldn't hum songs. I got busted on YouTube for humming a song the other day. Oh, really? They tried to flag me for, for humming a song. Because it was uh, in copyright? Yeah. <laughs> you wow. Do not hum a song on while well, live on YouTube. <laughs> you will get busted. Oh, yes. Uh, final question. This will be a quick one because we only got 20 seconds. Devil's Tower from Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Are you on Team Stump or are you on Team Rock? <laughs> um, so, I mean, I know the geological origin of it. And uh, to me, it's it, lo it, it looks like a tree stump for sure. But yeah, yeah. You're on Team Stump? Team Stump. Yes, yes, we got a good one. We got a good one. All right, music's on, everyone. Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Facebook, Spaced Out Radio Show. Here we go with our number two of Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott, hanging out with all of you, having a good time, talking a little sci-fi. I hope you are all enjoying as much as I am. We welcome back everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates across the continent, digitally on Revolution Radio and Talk Stream Live. Remember, you can check out all of our archives for free by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Just do me the favor Hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Odontolokia. Odontolokia. I think that's it. Odontolokia is your password. Use it wisely, Space Travelers, as the Clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. On Instagram, follow us at Spaced Out Radio Show, and on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio. Tonight, we are talking with author Robert J. Sawyer. He is an award-winning author one of the top sci-fi writers in the world. He is a member of the Order of Canada. This guy has done it all, and he's got a brand new book out that's just released, The Oppenheimer Alternative. We are going to learn about this momentarily. And Robert, welcome back. Thank you so much, Dave. I'm thrilled to be here. All right. Well, we got to give a shout out to Carmen Bertolo, who got you on this show. 
Every time he has a good writer, he, him and I got a really good relationship. He's a publicist. And he's like, Dave, I got a great writer on for you, Robert J. Sawyer. You got to get him on. And I'm like, okay, that's easy. Let's do it. Well, the reason that Car- Carmen's a wonderful guy uh, and uh, the reason Carmen has this pool of such great writers to draw upon is he's the publicist for, among other things, the L. Ron Hubbard presents the writers and illustrators of the future contests, which are twin parallel contests, one for beginning writers of science fiction and fantasy and the other for beginning illustrators of science fiction and fantasy. But the judges in both contests are the creme de la creme of professionals in those fields. The fields, they have been, now the contests have been going for 34 years now. Uh, So a number of the judges that we had early on have passed away in the interim. Anne McCaffrey, Dragon Riders of Pern fame, she was a judge. Well, she's passed away. We now have a second generation. Her son, Todd McCaffrey, who has continued that series, is a judge. Frank Herbert, the creator of Dune, the most successful science fiction uh, series of novels of all time, was a judge. Well, he's passed away, and his son, Brian, plus Brian's collaborator, Kevin J. Anderson, well-known in his own right for his own novels, uh, have continued on the Dune series, and they're both both judges. Larry Niven and Jerry Pornell were both judges until quite recently. Larry still is. Jerry just left us this past year. Uh, Nancy Kress, Nettie Okorafor, Orson Scott Card, Dr. Gregory Benford, uh, Dr. Doug Beeson. Uh, these are the writer judges. The, 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 the biggest names, and uh, I'm just so thrilled to be able to call them friends and colleagues and be a judge as well. Well, that is absolutely awesome, my friend. Absolutely awesome that that uh, you are doing that because I mean, there's so much young talent out there in the writers' field, and and you know this gives people an opportunity to really take the ball and see where their talents can take them, and you get to see who's up and coming with you. That's exactly right, and you know what? The best. Uh, I say this every year. I'm blown away. The best science fiction and fantasy ever written is being written today. The stuff being done now is so much better than the stuff of 20 years ago, which is so much better than the stuff of 40, 60, 80. You go right back to the origin of the genre. The quality of the prose, the sophistication of the characterization and the psychology of the characters, the, uh, the, the complex issues of, let's say, gender identity or racial politics or transhumanism or how we will actually sensibly mediate first contact with aliens uh, being dealt with by our authors are being dealt with at such a sophisticated level. And our contest, right, go to writersofthefuture.com to find out all about it. We have four quarterly deadlines, four times a year. Uh, the next one comes up at the end of next month, September 30th. Uh, you can enter for free as many times as you want. I mean, one time per quarter, but as many quarters as you want. We have people who have been entering for years on end. The grand prize winners and the runners up come to Los Angeles every spring for, we had to postpone it this year because of COVID, every spring for a uh, week long writer's workshop taught by those sterling names that I just mentioned to you with David Wolverton. Uh, who writes as uh, Dave Farland also, and uh, Timothy Powers, a great, great World Fantasy Award-winning writer, leading the workshop, and myself and the other names I mentioned doing individual seminars and lectures. Uh, And we publish the winners. Not only do you get money and get great tutoring from the judges, but the winners and the runners-up get published in an annual anthology entitled, you guessed it, L. Ron Hubbard Presents Writers of the Future. The current volume is number 34. It's in bookstores everywhere. It's hit a number of bestsellers lists. It has been, despite COVID, it has been our, our best-selling anthology of all time, of the three and a half decades we've been doing this. Wonderful. Wonderful. All right. Well, let's get to your new Al- uh, uh, album. Let's get to your new book. Do you, have, <laughs> do you have a hit album with it? Uh, no, I don't think so. But you have written a lot and done a lot of research about the Oppenheimer alternative. For people who may not be familiar with it, uh, let us know what it's all about. 
Sure. J. Robert Oppenheimer was the father of the atomic bomb. 75 years ago this summer, the world's first atomic bomb was created as the fruition of this thing called the Manhattan Project. And uh, Oppenheimer was the scientific director. He brought together at the behest of Albert Einstein, who was the guy who wrote to President Roosevelt and said, we got to have a, a, a secret effort to create an atomic bomb. It was Einstein who wrote or who signed that letter. It was actually written by another physicist, Leo Zillard. But uh, Einstein put out the call. Roosevelt responded. The United States ultimately partnering with Canada and Great Britain, created the world's first atomic bomb, ended the war in Japan by dropping two atomic bombs, and almost everybody involved, either immediately, as in the case of Oppenheimer, even before the bomb was dropped, as in the case of Leo Zillard, who was the man who started the whole thing with that letter that Einstein signed, or in the subsequent decades came to regret what they had done that they had created this weapon that without the greatest geniuses, it doesn't matter what FDR or Truman or Stalin or the emperor of Japan, whose name was Hirohito, or any of these people wanted, they didn't have the brains to build up. Scientists decided, yeah, okay, you want that thing, that weapon of mass destruction? I'll do it. Sure. Why not? They had a crisis of conscience. The Oppenheimer alternative is an alternate history where all of these characters, if they succeed in the challenge I give them in the plot, maybe get a chance at redemption in the end. To be able to say instead of, as Oppie said famously when the first atomic bomb went off, he was quoting Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, he had learned to read Sanskrit specifically so he could read the Gita in the original, but he quoted his own translation of it. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. And I want to give him and his colleagues, the other great physicists, Enrico Fermi, Edward Teller, uh, Hans Bethe, Richard Feynman, the opportunity to, if they succeed, turn around and at the end say, now we've become life, the saviors of the world. That's the Oppenheimer alternative in a nutshell. Going back to when you take a historic event like that, where it has been publicized and documented that that the many scientists who did work on the project, they did uh, after Hiroshima and Nagasaki had a, a real sense of guilt and, you know, a couple hundred thousand deaths on their hands of real people, not just anything that is on a progress report or anything like that. You know, when you look at that and... and and, you know, yes, we're 75 years in the future of this, so it's kind of hard to interview people about something like this. But do you look at the facts of, of the reports that they had spoken about this to try and get the feel and the emotion of what they were going through afterwards? Absolutely. The irony is that almost every one of the major characters wrote an autobiography, except my main character, J. Robert Oppenheimer. He never chose to write what he felt about this. So all we have are what comments that others make. Oh, he said to me he didn't like it. Oh, he was upset about this. So on and so And some speeches, of course, that he made. But he didn't write an autobiography. The others, Edward Teller, the one guy who never had any remorse, did. Uh, and all the other major figures did as well. Um, so we can trace very directly if we believe their accounts. And you always have to take an autobiography as being, to a certain degree, a public relations document by the person who has written it. But if we take their accounts at face value, we can say, OK, so-and-so had a change of heart at this point. Leo Zillard and uh, Eugene Wigner, both of whom were Hungarians, uh, who were, uh, you know, had been very fearful of Hitler getting the bomb first. They had their change of heart when Hitler died, when Hitler did with a, a revolver, uh, probably a Luger, actually, <laughs> what the atomic bomb 
uh, hadn't been able to do, which is put an end to the war in Germany. The bomb wasn't ready. The war in Germany, the war against the Nazis ended with conventional weaponry, mostly as wielded by Soviet soldiers, Russian soldiers, pressing in on uh, on Berlin. Uh, that's what ended World War II in Europe, VE, victory in Europe. And those scientists said, well, w w we don't need this bomb anymore. We were terrified that a madman like Hitler would get it first. That madman is dead. And our scientists have gone over. There were these missions that were sent over immediately, the Alsace missions, which is um, actually Latin for Grove. And uh, General Groves was the man in charge. It was one of the least effective code names of all time. The Alsace missions went over and, and talked to the Nazi scientists, looked over their papers, their working models. They were nowhere near an atomic bomb. They weren't even on the right path. They were never going to have one. And so a number of the scientists said before even that uh, we finished making atomic bombs, we should stop. No need. Oppenheimer himself, he had his change of heart after Hiroshima. He was up fine up to Hiroshima. And then he said, okay, we had to do it. We had to end this war. We had to show the world how terrible this weapon was. His change of heart came only 72 hours later when a second bomb was dropped on Nagasaki. And he said, wait a minute. The telegraph lines are down in Japan. The telephone lines are down. There's no such thing as TV. This is 1945. Uh, word is trying to get from the ruins of Hiroshima to the prime minister and the emperor in Tokyo over broken railways, uh, over broken roadways. That something unforeseen unknown, hitherto unprecedented has happened. We don't even wait for them to get word. It is a fact that both the prime minister and the emperor first learned that an atomic bomb had been used after the second one had been dropped when President Truman made a public announcement. They had no idea what was going on. And Oppie had his change of heart. He said, we didn't have to do that. A second time, again, that quickly? Well, that was inhuman. That was a bridge too far for him. So these moral quandaries that came at one stage or another for almost everybody involved, I think are well worth looking back on when we rush headlong into other morally fraught areas of science, such as, for instance, creating artificial intelligence. Well, that, when will the yeah. regret Go ahead. You know, when will the regret pop up for the various people who are rushing headlong into doing that right now? Well, you know what? I mean, I, I use this as a joke, but I but I do have a hint of seriousness in it. We all saw Terminator 2 and Terminator 1. Oh, yes. You know, like if that isn't a prediction of the future, it is like they, the scientists of today have taken that entire movie script and said, let's try and make this happen. Let's do this thing, man. And absolutely, this year, 2020, is the year uh, of Skynet actually coming online in the Terminator universe. 2018, two years ago now, was the year of the, the that Blade Runner with its replicants, its artificially intelligent uh, human duplicates was set. So, yeah, you know, I often say that science fiction writers and scientists both draw – on Greek myth. In science fiction writers, we're Cassandra. Cassandra was the prophet or prophetess who always foretold the future and would tell anybody around her what the future held, but nobody would believe her until it came to pass. That's us, the science fiction writer. The scientist, their template is Pandora's box. No matter how many evil and horrible secrets you try to hide away from them, there's always going to be somebody who comes along and says, oh, I know better. Let me open up that box and have a peek. And whether it is, uh, you know, the creation of artificial intelligence, whether it's the creation of the atomic bomb first, the hydrogen through nuclear fusion bomb second, whether it's the uh, uh, creation of uh, genetically modifying the human genome without any real oversight uh, from government or regulatory bodies. There's any number of scientists will say, 
Well, what is that toy over there? I'll play with it now, and someday down the road we can worry about the consequences. Yeah, it, and I'm as pro science a person as you will find, <laughs> but that is the scientific mentality. And the attitude of it is, well, well, we didn't know. We didn't know. How are we supposed? That's to, right. How are we supposed to know this? Well, you, and if you, you have Terminator seen my on my. That's right. If you've seen my picture on my website at sfwriter.com, you know, I'm bald as a cue ball. Well, you know why? It's because I pulled all my damn hair out because people kept saying, nobody told us that I'm going and every other science fiction writer is pulling our hair out saying, we have been telling you for decades, for century or more about these possible downsides. And you just ignored us until it was too late. Are there ever any scientists who have approached you and maybe in one of your past writings and said, how did you know that? How did you know that was going to be oh, the yeah. outcome? Absolutely. One of the quotes, he passed away recently, but I was lucky enough to know him a bit. Uh, Marvin Minsky founded the Artificial Intelligence Laboratory at MIT. He was the man that Arthur C. Clarke turned to when he was creating HAL for 2001 A Space Odyssey for advice about what artificial intelligence was going to be like. And later in his life, Minsky said, lately, I'm inspired by ideas from Robert J. Sawyer. And I mean, that just justified every syllable I'd ever committed to uh, a word processing document in my career. That somebody who was at the absolute forefront of his field, my very first novel was an AI novel. Many of my novels, the very well-known trilogy, Wake, Watch, and Wonder, the WWW trilogy, about the World Wide Web gaining consciousness. AI is one of my topics. And to have him come and say that to me, just, uh, you know, and say it in print, excuse me, I saw it as a quote in print. Oh, my God, that was just uh, so wonderful to hear. So, yeah, it absolutely has happened. It's like Gretzky dropping your name. It, yeah, no, exactly. That's right. That's right. He's hockey, right? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't. They said that about Oppenheimer, too. He can talk to you knowledgeably about anything at all, said General Groves. And then he paused and said, well, anything but sports. <laughs> well, I, I do have to ask you, in, in regards to that, when you have people coming up to you, and maybe they are of a scientific ilk or whatever they may be, whatever their background may be, does it does it shock you to this day when you hear them say, how did you how did you come up with that? How did you figure that out? How did you know that science was going down that angle? I mean, or is it just imagination that takes you there and it's luck of the draw? No, you know what it is? There's a distinct difference between a science fiction writer and a scientist, and that is this. A science fiction writer is a generalist. We know a little bit about every field of science, plus some philosophy and some history and some psychology, blah, 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 a lot of things. A scientist ends up being so hyper-specialized in whatever their narrow, narrow field is that they're lucky if there are 20 people all over the planet who have the same specialty as they do. And half of them they intensely dislike on a personal basis, right? Because they're their rivals. They have the competing point of view, the alternative theory. So what we do is we see... There's something going on over here in quantum physics and something going on over there in neuroscience. And those two professors would never know each other unless they happen to serve on a collective bargaining committee or something together like that on the university uh, faculty. Otherwise, they'd have no interaction. But we, with the overview, the generalist overview, can say, ah, you know, there's going to be not just quantum computing, but quantum consciousness. And it's going to affect reality the same way that we argue that our own consciousness collapses the wavefront and determines from all the possibilities what the given reality that we happen to share is going to be. The, having that overview is our gift uh, to the intellectual discourse of the planet. Okay, so if we take a look at this from a paranormal stance, and using paranormal as an umbrella term here for everything that is weird and strange that people are experiencing, do you think science 
or scientists, for that matter, never mind the grants or anything that they would need in order to, to take this subject seriously. But do you think that for the majority of them are dropping the ball on this? Or do you think that the majority of them are just too fearful to come down that path of ghosts or aliens or Bigfoot because of the stigma that is attached to it in the mainstream? So Thomas Kuhn, K-U-H-N, wrote, you know, the structure of scientific uh, revolutions. Um, and he's the guy who gave us that term paradigm shift. And what he basically said was that there will be a received wisdom, a, a suite of acceptable interpretations that will hold on until one of two things happens. Either the old guard will retire or it will expire, meaning it will actually die off. And so things that were absolutely anathema to one generation and will be, you'll be told, you'll be taken aside by your thesis advisor or a senior faculty member who will say, no, 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 Dave, don't go, you're, you're, that's a career killer. Don't even look into that field. For a time in the uh, post-Viking period, by which I mean the Viking landers on Mars, Searching, being an exobiologist, being interested in life on Mars, that was a career color. You couldn't go to NASA and say, that was my chief interest. I want to, no, 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 don't, there's no life on Mars. Don't even go down that. Now, of course, it's the number one reason that we're funding missions is to find out if there is right. or was life on Mars. Right, Robert. In my particular. Ro Robert, hold we that thought because we do got to take a break. I do apologize to you for that. No, Award-winning author. In the sci-fi movement, Mr. Robert J. Sawyer is with us. We'll continue the sci-fi talk on Spaced Out Radio coming up right after this. I'll just take a little break myself. We'll be right back. Here you go. Hi, tubeubers. What's happening? I'm telling you, man, Terminator is real. We're heading down that road. If you have friends named Sarah or John Connor, you might want to start shying away from them. I think we're at that point now. Just saying. <laughs> Trying to see where this forest fire is in Penticton, B.C. Southeast side. Holy shit, that's my sister's side. Well, I better call her tomorrow. Southeast, hold on, there's south. East, yeah, the shit, that's close to my sister's. And just FYI, I am back. Yeah, I better. Sorry, I'm gonna quickly text my sister here because uh, where she lives is under evacuation alert for forest yeah, fires. Yeah, go right ahead. Yeah, I'm just looking at this on Twitter. Now we wait. She's probably sleeping. The Stu Gerson! Right there, buddy. The Stu Gerson is here. We have to restart the show now, Robert. Stu Gerson's arrived. <laughs> Very good. All right, welcome. Mm-hmm. Trying to drop a who's Gretzky. Look at you, you sarcastic sucker, you. That was for you, Robert. I, I I hear him. <laughs> I know who Gretzky is. I know. He owns a diner in Toronto. Just a little bit. I have seen it. Diner. Wayne's Gretzky's bar. <laughs> and I know who Tim Horton was. Oh, he was a donut guy. Donut guy. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You're one of the only people in Toronto who doesn't have their uh, their seats sitting on Young Street waiting for the Stanley Cup parade. That's right, exactly. But I know it's named for Lord Stanley. I know a little bit about it, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> mm. 
Mm hmm. I'm waiting for my sister to text back here. She is texting. I see the dots going. It's kind of where Gretzky's winery is in that area, too. That's true. Yeah. Mm hmm. I mean, like any wise and intelligent man who's made lots of money, he's diversified, right? Oh, well, my sister is evac Good for her. That's good. Oh, well, they got police escorted out. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, I'm glad she's safe. Yeah, no kidding. No kidding. I had to go through that three years ago. That sucks. It sucks. Now, is this... This isn't rioting. This is no. uh, weather, right? Yeah, this is forest fires. Oh, wow. Yeah. Penticton, British Columbia. Yeah, that's like totally where my sister lives. That entire mountain on the top side is on in flames right now. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that ain't good. That is literally close to my sister's house. Really close. The entire mountain is is going here. It sucks because she's my evac house for when mine goes down. Right, right. All right, we're just coming out of the final commercial. Cool. Hi, Jenna. All right. Hi, Teresa. How are you? You're looking gorgeous tonight. All right, 10 seconds. We pass the halfway point of Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I want to remind you that if you missed portions of this show or others, do me a favor and head over to our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio, and hit that subscribe button because all of our archives are free for you. All right. On our website, spacedoutradio.com, we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. Tonight, we are talking with award-winning author Robert J. Sawyer. He is a member of the Order of Canada. He is a Hall of Famer when it comes to sci-fi writing. This man has done it all in the field of science fiction, and we're lucky to have him here tonight. Robert, welcome back. Thank you so much, Dave. I'm thrilled to be here. Me too. Your energy for... Let's see. It's late for you. Very late for you. It is one thirty-six in the A of M here. Wow. Yes, it is. <laughs> wow. Wow. I'm loving it. I'm loving it. Well, we're we're very thankful that you're here and, and that you're taking the time with us. We, right before the break, we were getting into artificial intelligence and the fact that this is becoming more and more of a reality. Do you think everyday humans are ready for it? Are we ready to be chipped? Are we ready to go down that road that almost seems biblical in the sense of revelation? That's a very interesting question, because I think we are 
getting very close to a turning point for the human race, whether you want to call it the singularity, whether you want to call it uh, a revelation, whatever it is, we're reaching a point where our technological tools are letting us redefine fundamentally what it means to be human. And uh, the direction we choose to go with that, and I suspect it's not one direction, and I'm not putting in a plug for a music group here, uh, I'm saying that as with everything, there'll be all kinds of people, you know, not to name drop here, but a friend of mine is Mike Lazaridis. Mike Lazaridis founded Research in Motion, the maker of the BlackBerry for a time, the most popular portable telecommunications device in the world. He lives in Waterloo, Ontario. He founded and put the headquarters of his company there. And I said to him once, Mike, why did you choose Waterloo? It's surrounded by Mennonites, which it is, right? The beautiful Mennonite farming communities who eschew high technology, right? In other words, you put your headquarters in a place surrounded by people who will never use your product. And he said, you know what? They're the backup plan for humanity. If this technological world that I've devoted my life to, Mike Lazaridis, that I've devoted my life to, falls apart, they're going to carry on and keep going without a without a missing a step. And I want to know those people and be near those people and be supportive of those people. And I thought that's exactly right. So we're not going to see one future where everybody gets a chip in their head. Everybody becomes half cyborg. Everybody, uh, you know, uploads into the matrix. We're going to see a fragmented bazillion different individual futures. And I think that's all wonderful. Yes, I'm glad I come from a Mennonite family. Thank you. Thank you for that. Oh, that was a good reminder. Well, you would love my novel Quantum Night, which is set in uh, in Winnipeg. But uh, one of the main characters, mm -hmm. uh, uh, his first name is Menno, uh, is a Mennonite. And it is very much, uh, in part, a an appreciation of the Mennonite uh, approach to life and the Mennonite pacifism, which is something oh, that yes. I very much take to heart. Oh yeah, my you know, my, great, my, my mom's yeah. my mom's side of the family is all the strict Haldeman Mennonite, right? And so I'll tell you, you ever get in trouble, they are the first people there to help, ever, ever. They, yes, they don't care if you are are drug infected, you know, like you're a drug addict or an alcoholic or. Or whatever, they are there to help, you know. But they sure couldn't tell you who Wayne Gretzky is. There's, a, believe it or not, there's actually Canadians out there who don't know who Gretzky is, and they've never voted. That's right. And they've never voted. And they've never, and absolutely, absolutely. Um, I, I have nothing but admiration for Mennonites. I have nothing but admiration for anybody who tries their best to live a moral life by whatever their moral standards are. What I don't like are people who are simply opportunists, who are, uh, you know, uh, not thinking through the moral ramifications of what they're doing, which is, again, we come back to my latest novel, The Oppenheimer Alternative. Why did I write about these scientists? Because they were so hell-bent, and I use that term advisedly, to dive in to creating weapons of mass destruction that they didn't stop and think until those weapons had actually been used about the morality of it. So, you know, more power to those people who stop and think before they act. Uh, the world is better off for having such people in it. Do you think, uh, you know, maybe not on a scientific level, but the way science is going down that sci-fi road over the last, say, 20, 30 years especially, do you think there will come a time when we're just going to have too much technology, that it's not going to be like the Jetsons, it's going to be more like uh, uh, Orwell's 1984 and we're going to literally have to either make a decision that that's the way we go or we collapse it all and go back to the way it was. You know, you and I live in Canada. I know most of your audience is in the United States. Canada is far ahead of the United States in terms of privacy legislation in terms of making sure that people's data is protected. Our privacy commissioner's office, which is a federal department, and also the individual provincial privacy commissioners are lauded on the world stage as leaders in this 
issue. 1984 was the concern that we would lose all privacy, that all information would be controlled by the government. And uh, I think we're at a turning point. We're seeing in the United States right now uh, a real attempt for the government to control and delegitimize uh, traditional media and be the sole source of information. Uh, and I think we're going to go down one route or another. There's a utopian path and there's a dystopian path. And it is up to us as an electorate, if you're not a Mennonite who, is, who choose not to be part of the electorate, as the electorate, as people who vote with our dollars, as people who choose how we're going to invest, what surplus monies we have, and as people who choose what kind of careers we're going to go into to choose which future we want, the positive or the negative, the red pill or the blue pill. Do you think society could do a retraction, though? Could we go back to the way it was of, of almost like the Amish or the Mennonites with the horse-drawn carriages and, and you know, everybody coming together, 300 people to come together to move a barn because it's not on the right uh, part of the field? You know, on a gross level, it's really hard to take big steps back. But you look at the 1960s, where everybody was smoking themselves to death. And that's all but gone in, uh, in our society now. You look at the repression of women and people of color. I will not be so bold as to say that that's almost gone. But boy, has progress been made. We make progress all the time in all kinds of significant ways. The ecological movement, we no longer, you look at, you know, the videos that came out of the 1939 World's Fair, the, well, those were movies, obviously, or the world of tomorrow at Disneyland. It was all about everybody having disposable clothing. Never again would you wash dishes. They would all be thrown out every day and replaced with brand new ones. We have taken a huge step back towards sustainability and ecological sensitivity. And in that very significant way, yes, we have rolled back the clock. Okay, but do you think society could survive? All right. I mean, you look at the majority of kids today, or pe even young adults today, they have no idea where their food comes from. They have, right. you know, they're worried about glucose and fructose and 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 all of these hypersensitive issues that people have with food that wasn't around 25, 30 years ago. Plus, I mean, this could really, really collapse a society. So every previous civilization has collapsed. Humanity has survived, but the Roman Empire is long gone. The British Empire, for that matter, is long gone. Uh, the American hegemony is falling apart. The 20th century, not the 21st, will be remembered as the American century. China and India are ascendant right now on the world stage. Things change, and absolutely they don't. They, they change with a lot of difficulty for a lot of people. I, are we facing a planet-wide extinction? Maybe as related to environmental issues. Um, but are we resilient as a species? We absolutely are. We, uh, yes, for sure. Uh, you know, not to uh, minimize it, but as General Buck Turgidson said in Dr. Strangelove, I'm not saying we won't get our hair mussed a little, but I am saying, as he said, 10 to 20 million dead tops when he was talking about nuclear war. Well, I don't want to be quite that glib. There will be a lot of difficulty in any major shift that humanity faces. There always has been. There always will be. But the species will go on and hopefully will be better. No, I, I understand that. But I, I think something like this would be cataclysmic. Most people don't know how to grow their own food. Okay, the thought of, sure. the, the thought of having to hunt Bambi for a meal doesn't even cross people's minds you know i right. mean i mean you look at you look at the way you know hunting especially in metropolises is so frowned upon yet you go into rural communities and everybody hunts camouflage is a is a fashion statement 
For sure. Right? For sure. And when you have millions of people living in these metropolises, I mean, look at Toronto, 8.5 million, or you go to New York, 12 million people. There is no way that if all of a sudden, you know, technology stopped, that, oh, absolutely. that these people would even know what to do. They'd be eating right. themselves. We have um, Soylent Green is people. We have almost 8 billion human beings now. When I entered university, we had, which was 1979, we had a little over 4 billion human beings. So we have had this runaway population growth in the 20th century and the, now into the two decades of the 21st. Uh, at an unsustainable level, except through a very advanced civilization. Absolutely, if civilization collapses, we're not going to be a population of 8 billion anymore. We're going to be a population of a minor fraction of that number, for sure, if it collapses. And if you want to take a negative point of view, let's look at it this way. You believe probably more uh, than I do in the uh, extant existence of extraterrestrial civilizations. Oh, yeah, I've got but aliens. One of, I've got aliens, my one, friend. Sure, but one of the standard answers to the Fermi paradox, named for Enrico Fermi, one of the Manhattan Project scientists, he's a character in my novel, The Oppenheimer Alternative, his paradox is, if the universe should be teeming with life, where are all the aliens? And the answer often given is, you know what? Technological civilizations just don't survive very long. We invented radio in 1895. That's the year Marconi invented the radio. And 50 years later, precisely 50, 1945, we invented the ability to destroy ourselves, the atomic bomb. 75 years have passed since or 120 since the development of the atomic bomb, 125 since the invention of radio. And we're barely holding on by a thread. Will the civilization survive 200 years as a radio broadcaster? 300, 3,000, 3 million? There are an awful lot of scientists who will say no. Once you have the ability to destroy yourself, whether it's through atomic weapons or subsequently as we've had now through genetic uh, you know, bioweapons and so forth, uh, you just don't survive that long. That may very well be the reality, that whatever alien civilizations that uh, you feel may exist, if they are coming here, they're coming here because they're 50 or 100 or 150 years more advanced than us, but they will wake themselves out because that's the inevitable fate of technological civilizations. Maybe that's true. I don't like to think it's true, but it might well be. And that's where I laugh at a lot of the futurists out there, because they always say radio is dead. Radio is not Ooh. allowed to die. Radio can't die, because if there is ever some sort of collapse of civilization or technology, you could still send radio waves out to get messages out to people. That's very simple. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. No medium ever dies. Live theater didn't die. Television said uh, that it was going to kill the movies. The movies said they were going to kill um, live theater. Live theater, with, you know, radio, every technology survives. Every technology survives. And one or another is ascendant in a given era, depending on... A, on personal taste, and B, on uh, just happenstance. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Radio broadcasters will be around uh, forever. Absolutely. Robert J. Sawyer is our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio. we got about seven and a half minutes before we have to go to break at the top of the hour. Robert, in regards to that type of collapse, you know, for people who are listening, just from a sci-fi standpoint, and I realize this is all fictional as we talk about this, but, you know, it is scary to think that technology and the way people are thinking these days, we are almost headed down this road. All right. What is a predictive outcome that people should prepare for, just in case? I hate to be uh, a bearer of bad news, but we got to prepare for the next epidemic. We should have been prepared for this epidemic, and we weren't. We were taken 
by we, I mean our governments and so forth, were taken totally by surprise, despite the fact that in that same year that radio was invented, 1895, H.G. Wells wrote his story, The Stolen Bacillus. Bacillus is a strain of bacteria, uh, where he uh, said, we're going to face this. We're going to face epidemics, pandemics, epidemics. We're going to face the threat of a biological catastrophe, and we should prepare for it. And we just ignored him. And you know what? We're already reopening on the basis of COVID supposedly being under control. COVID-19 is called that because it was discovered in 2019. There'll be a COVID-22, a COVID-34, a COVID-57. And every single time, it will take us by surprise because we refuse to learn the lessons and spend the money to be prepared for catastrophes. And yet there's diseases everywhere. You know, my cousin, who's a doctor, he's one of the most brilliant men that that I've met. And he, he he's a disease freak. Literally, he has he has lectured all over the world talking about infectious diseases. So COVID is right up his alley. And I asked him a couple of months ago when the, when the first heavy break came out in Canada, because he's running one of the COVID programs here in British Columbia. And I, and I asked him, I said, you know, like, what do you think caused this? And he took a deep breath. And he's like, if you know him, he's not an environmentalist. He's a scientist. Mm-hmm. Okay. And he said, every now and again, Mother Nature has a reset because she gets really pissed off at the way we treat this planet. And then he said something that that really caught my attention with it. He goes, you have to remember, humans are not meant to go to places that they're not supposed to. This is why when people travel from North America to Thailand or or to China yes. or to Asia, we have to or Africa, we have to, you know, for weeks previous to that trip, you have to be putting injections into people so their body yes. can can actually handle the 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 diseases that they the that they will be hit with. It's much like people coming here. All right. We don't see it because we're already here. And I, you know, I, as a member of the Order of Canada, I conduct one of my, my one superpower that goes with that is I can perform uh, citizenship ceremonies. I induct new Canadian citizens. I'm all in favor of immigration. What is the problem is we have made a hobby, a leisure time activity of globetrotting. Our parents and our grandparents, if they moved once from one country to another, it was the one time they moved, right? Uh, Now we think, oh, I've gone two years without an international vacation. I want to hit every spot. I want to see Kenya and Tokyo, and I want to see uh, India, and I want to see, you know, every corner of the United States and bring all my diseases with me and get all the diseases that are present there. There. H.G. Wells again, he warned us about this. What defeated the Martian invaders to Earth was that they came here without being prepared for our bacteria. And the reality is that we now, any ba- you know, the, the difference between an epidemic and a pandemic is an epidemic is localized and a pandemic is a wide area. What takes every epidemic that used to burn itself out in a local population quickly and turns it into a pandemic is our worldwide airline travel that we do with at the drop of a hat on a routine basis. Not every one of the 8 billion of us, but hundreds of millions of us travel every single year. And that absolutely, your, your, your doctor relative friend is absolutely right. It puts... Things that would have been isolated into local populations and spreads them worldwide with horrific consequences. It really is, and we and we don't think about it. We don't think about it. Like not at all. Like a person, not, fr- not a, a second. Per- a person from the middle of North America is not prepared for the diseases, the bugs, the the air, the water of Africa. It's just not happening, or, well, the, or the jungles here, of Asia. In our country. Uh, Sure, but in Canada, look at what's going on here. We have the Atlantic bubble. We have the four Atlantic provinces, which are just between them all together, two and a half million people, right? Less than 
than one city in other parts of the country, uh, have created a bubble. And they said, nobody comes in, nobody goes out. And that's a sensible response. Even interprovincial or interstate travel is moving, you know, bacteria. They may move very quickly for their size, but they're microscopic. Your average, average bacterium or virus particle on its own travels a few meters in its lifetime on its own. It only gets to go thousands of kilometers because we give it free passage on an airplane. Exactly. Exactly. As we got about a minute and a half here before we have to go to break at the top of the hour. So with that happening, and, and you know, I, I got a great question that I want to ask you from one of our listeners, Nicole, uh, when we come back from break. But with that happening, you know, as people, can we handle that? Can, can we handle our own personal existences becoming more introverted? We got a minute. Yes, is the answer. And remember, for an awful lot of people who are introverts, our current mode of existence has been extremely uncomfortable. They've been anxious when they have to socialize and go to work and fake good humor and bonhomie at social events. So actually, what we're seeing is a different population being ascendant right now. There's many introverts as there are extroverts in the world. It's just their turn. Yes, I know what that's like. I know what that's like. But what drives me nuts, my friend, especially in today's current society, is the paranoia. I cannot oh, yeah. handle That sets my anxiety off big time. Big time right now. No, I totally agree. Uh, you know, uh, we live in a time, a very fraught time where everybody is anxious and everybody is overwrought and overconcerned. We can talk after the break about why evolution made us that way. I think it's the uh, oh, yeah. it's a glitch in our genetic programming. Absolutely, my friend. And and uh, you know what? This is such an intriguing conversation. This is an area where we haven't really gone down before on this show. So it's kind of cool thinking of futurism, science fiction, what is becoming a reality. You know what I'm saying? It's kind of cool. So thank you for doing that. Robert J. Sawyer, we have him for another 30 minutes before we are going to hook up with Vancouver and go right across the country with the shift, talking some UFOs. And of course, the, the SOR News Wire and the Thought of the Dave, a jam-packed hour three of Spaced Out Radio coming up next. All right, my friend, I'm going to step away here for two seconds, and I'll be right back. Very good. Hi there, this is the paranormal lawyer, Michael W. Hall. I'd like to invite you to listen in each Sunday night, where we're going to open up your eyes to everything strange and paranormal. I will be hosting some great guests with topics that affect us all, such as UFOs, ghosts, and everything paranormal. Let's learn together on Spaced Out Radio Sunday with myself, Michael W. Hall, the paranormal lawyer at spacedoutradio.com. For the price of one cup of coffee a month, you can become an SOR Space Traveler. The Space Travelers Club is a place where you can interact with other listeners, either live during the show or on our great forum. We want your stories, pictures, comments, and ideas. You'll get live video streams, exclusive content, and be a part of our newsletter. Stay in touch with everything SOR. The Space Travelers Club is just five bucks a month at spacedoutradio.com. Hey, space travelers, this is John Resig, founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. If you know anything about our website, you know we like to do things a little differently. We're not some faceless organization collecting money for a nebulous cause. Our donor dollars go directly toward life-improving items. Then we give those items directly to an underdog who needs it most. To become a donor with Spaced Out Radio's official charity, Chive Charities, just go to chivecharities.org forward slash donate. I'm feeling a little spicy tonight. What to do? What to do? Why not get Bumblefoot? Four million Scoville units of pure hard rock. Bumblefoot hot sauce has come in three flavors. The burning Bumble. Tone it down a bit with Bumblelicious and throw the sauce on everything. Spicing up. Bumble me, baby. Bumblefoot hot sauce. Get it today at kajons.com. 
The party is always on at the Moose Vancouver. The Moose Vancouver is where you want to be when visiting Canada's West Coast. Open until 2 a.m. nightly, the Moose cranks up the rock while serving some of the best rated food in the city. The menu starts at $6.95. Why party anywhere else in Vancouver when the Moose is right there? Get your horns up and rock with the Moose, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. Looking for creative ways to get your company out in the public? How about advertising on Spaced Out Radio? Our sales department is waiting to hear from you, and we can work around any budget. From commercial spots to banners to special promotions, there are many opportunities to get your name and product out to our SOR listeners. For a price guide and more information, please contact us at sales at spacedoutradio.com. We're adding to the entertainment line for Spaced Out Radio. I'm subscribed to our YouTube channel and check out Cryptid Tales, where I will take you on a journey into some of the strangest legends and lore from around the world, relaying the stories to you of the strange creatures and experiences that people have had throughout time. You can find Cryptid Tales at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. And while you're there, don't forget to check out our free archives and leave a comment. See you there. Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening, because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is Watching. The SOR Vault is open for business, and do we have some cool swag for you to pick up? All you have to do is head over to our website and click on the SOR Vault. You have a variety of cool logos to choose from, and put them on anything you want. T-shirts, hoodies, hats, coffee mugs, you name it, we can get it to you. So do your shopping by supporting the store you love. Get your Spaced Out Radio swag at the SOR Vault today. We all know on Spaced Out Radio, we love a good beard and mustache. So why not take care of your facial hair with Mighty Moose Beard Oil? Made in Canada, we're taking care of beards and stashes around the world. We use 100% natural ingredients with our oils and balms to make your whiskers feel silky smooth. Use promo code SOR2019 at MightyMooseBeard.com today. Sorry about that. I quickly uh, called my sister to see if she was okay. Got to look after the family, no problem at all. Yeah, they they found out at 3 o'clock that they were being evacuated because that's when the fire really started to take off. And, uh, and uh, now they're sitting in a parking lot because the highway is jammed because there's uh, the highway through there is just absolutely horrific. You'd think in today's society, well, I mean, even a four-lane highway is where it's two lanes both ways. But uh, yeah. They're just sitting there waiting, figuring out what to do. So, yeah, what do you do? I've been through For it. Sure, abs. Y- yeah, you got. It. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It sucks, man. It sucks. That happened to me three years ago, and it the fires came within like two and a half miles of my house. But this is way closer to my sister's house than what happened to me, man. Way closer. So hopefully, knock on wow. wood, we can push that fire the other way. Uh, what I will get you to do, yeah. what I will get you to do here um, is when I say good night to you at the bottom of the hour, don't hang up. Just kind of sit there. I'm gonna go into commercial break and then I'll give a proper uh, thank you for coming on. So for sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. I appreciate that. Thank you. All right, we got five seconds here. you like to connect with us head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info now back to dave scott and sor here we go kicking off the third and final hour of spaced out radio tonight i am your host dave scott thank you so much for taking the time to join us we really do appreciate all of you tuning on in hi to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around north america and digitally on talk stream live and revolution radio remember all of our archives are free 
free by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do old Davy the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Uh, I know I'm going to butcher this one. Odontolokia. Odontolokia is your password. Use it wisely, space travelers, as the clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website, spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. On Twitter, you can follow us at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. For the final time tonight, we introduce author Robert J. Sawyer. He is a member of the Order of Canada. He is in the Hall of Fame for sci-fi writers. I mean, this guy has done it all. I mean, you look at his website, sfwriter.com, and there is just a plethora of books here on everything that is going on. And we're talking a little bit of AI right now. Robert, welcome back. Thank you so much, Dave. I'm delighted to be here. All right. I want to get straight to Nicole's question here because I love this question. And she is asking, do you think it's possible that there's going to be a Cylon or Skynet type of evil AI robot threat? It's possible, but I don't think it's likely. And here's why. We human beings and every other life form on this planet is the result of Darwinian evolution. Darwinian evolution is survival of the fittest, which really means survival of the nastiest. It means that I was able to, or my ancestors were able to, take all the food for their children so they would survive and allow their neighbor's children to starve to death so they wouldn't survive. The ones who were the nastiest, who took the most, the survivors in an economy of scarcity are the ancestors of every single one of us. That informs every aspect of our psychology. Computers live in a completely different realm. They live in a realm of absolute abundance. You want to look at this document and I'm looking at it? We don't have to fight over it. We just make another copy of the document. An infinite number. Computers exist in a world where supply always precisely equals demand. There's no competition for resources. And so there's no natural inclination for a computer to be rapacious, for a computer to be evil or conniving or trying to figure out how to pull one over and do take the advantage of and best somebody else. And so from that point of view, I suspect they will look at us as being the evil ones, not the other way around. Okay. So as we go through that, all right, we see technology like iPhones, Google Google Play, you know, uh, last year during Christmas time, the little mini Google home uh, speakers were all the rage and we hear some strange talking. We are really connected in our lives. Technology is literally controlling everything right now. Everything. I mean, I'll give you an example of this and I'm, and I'm curious and this will help with a lot of people here. And it freaks me out when this happens. OK. Two years ago. I was craving a bag of chips, and I don't usually eat potato chips. However, at this time I was. So I go upstairs. I go into my cupboard, grab a bag of chips, come down. Within two hours, my cell phone on Facebook, I go into the app. It is showing me advertisements for Miss Vicky's potato chips. I never well, said. they are the best. Well, true, <laughs> true. However, I never said Miss Vicky's. I hear you. I never mentioned that I wanted potato chips. All right. And yet here I was holding a bag of Miss Vicky's potato chips in my hand. Okay. Crunching away because they have a great crunch to them. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden there's advertisements all over my Facebook and Twitter on Miss Vicky's chips. That's scary when that's happening, and it's yes, being reported more and scary. more. For sure, for sure. And, you know, 
those of us who remember the early days of computing, like 10 years ago, will remember that Google's motto used to be, what? Don't be evil. They don't say that anymore. I don't think that it's a nefarious AI that is doing this. I think Google is harvesting every little bit of information it can about us and uh, at the behest of human programmers to line the pockets of human stockholders with dividends from one of the most valuable companies, not just in the current economy, but in the history of human Commerce, Google and Apple, Microsoft, the most valuable com- – and Amazon, the most valuable companies that have ever existed in the lifetime of the world. And it ain't because there are avaricious AIs that care about gold and diamonds. It be, it's because there are programmers using every tool at their advantage. Now, every once in a while, there will be a coincidence. And there also will be, you know, people say, I never even mentioned Miss Vicky's. And then you will look back and say, oh, actually, I said under my breath at one point, oh, thank God it's not Lay's. And I don't mean any insult to Lay's. You open your cupboard. Oh, good. We've got the good stuff. It's Miss Vicky's. And you said it out loud. And you weren't conscious of it. And that's been capitalized on. I knew this was pure evil nine years ago, Dave. My younger brother died of lung cancer. And I had my correspondence going back and forth in Gmail with, you know, all the people you have to inform, family members, old friends, what have you. And what starts popping up is my Gmail ads, cut rate funeral services, right? It wasn't that Skynet was reading my email. Yes, it was a computer and an algorithm that was doing it, but it was doing it 100% at the behest of ultimately of advertisers who thought paying for ads that keyed into people discussing funerals online would somehow make human beings richer. And we give away our privacy and our self-determination because we like having Facebook for free or a search engine for free or YouTube, the medium we're using right now, for free, realizing only at the backs of our minds and never really paying much attention to it, that we're giving away more information than Nazi Germany ever had about its enemies or its citizens, that the height of the Soviet Union ever had about its citizenry. We're giving it away freely to not governments, but things that can be just as evil and corrupt and manipulative big corporations. Is there an end to it? Is there a way to to take that away, to get that power back in the hand of people? You know, people have to take the power. Nobody is holding a gun to anybody's head and saying, you have to be on Facebook. Nobody is saying, my God, man, haven't you tweeted in the last 24 hours? Nobody is even saying you have to use Google. DuckDuckGo is a very good search engine that does not track your previous searches doesn't keep your previous search history. Uh, it, it's got a weird name, but go look it up. Duck, like you know the for the the the, the bird. Duck, duck, go. Uh, I'm on the board of directors of a company called Purism. We make privacy and security focused Linux based laptop computers, and um, our whole uh, suite of software and our operating system, everything is open source. And we tell we make a phone now too, and we say, well, you could put Google. And Facebook and Twitter on our phone if you want, but it kind of defeats the whole purpose. You're basically getting in bed with the devil when you choose to do that. So at some point, I think people, there'll be a tipping point. We're already seeing it. A lot of people did walk away from uh, uh, Facebook in the last year. Now, they came back out of loneliness. Uh, but there was a lot of protest against uh, Facebook's intrusive policies, and a lot of people said, enough of this. I don't need this. Remember, MySpace is dead. Hotbot, which was the most popular search engine originally, and then YouTube uh, – sorry, Yahoo's search engine was the most popular. And then 
Google at the moment. There's no guarantee that just because you were on top, I mentioned my friend Mike Lazaridis and Research in Motion and the BlackBerry, you can be number one today and gone tomorrow. The public ultimately controls who has access to its information. So why do you think we are so free, knowing that this is going on, knowing that this bugs us, knowing that, you know, we are giving away all of this information because nobody reads the the small print on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or Pinterest or whatever the search engine or the social media site may be. Very few people actually do. All right. We just want to get going and meet up with our friends. I mean, that's usually the way it goes. However... Do we realize the extent of harm that we have caused ourselves? And this is the thing. We don't, some of us do, of course, absolutely. And I, you know, weighed it as an author. I feel I have to have a high social media profile to sell my books in the current economy. And particularly so this past year, or I shouldn't say the whole year, but the past four or five months, my novel, The Oppenheimer Alternative, came out the beginning of June. Every bookstore in North America, brick and mortar, was closed the month of June. If I wanted to have any economic impact, i.e. make money, i.e. feed myself and my family, uh, I had to have an online presence. So I made a deal with the devil. I was online as much as I possibly could be for June, July, and even here. Now we're halfway through August. Uh, because I felt that the trade-off was worth it for me. But for most people, it's like we alluded to this earlier. In the 60s, almost everybody smoked themselves to death. And if they weren't smoking themselves to death, they were drinking themselves to death. The amount of people who are drinking themselves to death and smoking themselves to death today is way, way less than it was 50 years ago. We've only been dealing with Google and uh, and YouTube and uh, the other services you mentioned, Pinterest and so forth. Some of them are only a few years old. Some are maybe a decade or two old. Amazon is 25 years old this year, founded in 1995. These are young, young, young organizations by the standards of our civilization, and they could all fall by the wayside. So I suspect, yes, we will grow up just the same way we grew up about a lot of the things we foolishly did in decades gone by. Okay, but you have a lot of people, though. It's not just uh, people in the 50 uh, 50 and up crowd anymore, but you have a lot of people who now are escaping cities. They are, you know, because of the internet, they can work absolutely anywhere. They're Mm -hmm. going to these smaller communities that they know nothing about. However, they are going there because they're looking for that simpler type of life. Yet we got these power stores, much like Amazon Online, where you can have anything within 48 to 72 hours. Okay, majority of stuff. You you have Walmarts, you have everything that is kind of controlling your life sitting around you. You know, how do you how do you base yourself and live a simpler life in say a smaller community? when you are constantly greeted by these monsters. Yeah, it's a very interesting and it's a difficult dichotomy. I think one of the reasons people like smaller communities is they've come to realize that there's something very ersatz, something very second-rate, fake, and phony about so-called online friends. Facebook used this word, you're my friend online. Well, You're my connection. You're my contact. You're somebody who I've agreed to let look at my stuff. But your friend, generally speaking, when you talk about who's your friend in real life, how do you define your friends? Well, it's somebody whose house you've been to, somebody who's been to your house, somebody who you've broken bread with, shared a meal with, somebody who you've seen cry and has seen you cry, right? Somebody you go on a trip with or a vacation with or hold hands with at a movie or whatever it is, right? You're... And and there's a realization that despite Facebook labeling every rando who you happen to accept online as your friend, that it isn't really the same thing. And I think that's a huge part of the appeal. Because I live in a – I'm a successful guy. I live in a big city and I have a big penthouse apartment. I never talk to my next-door neighbor. 
I don't even know the name of my next door neighbor. I'm in penthouse two. Penthouse one is right next door. I don't know the guy's name. We pass each other in the elevator every once in a blue moon and we'll sort of nod at each other and say, don't worry, I'm not going to kill you today. And he nods and says, no, I didn't bring a weapon. I'm not going to kill you. And that's the extent of our interaction. That's what big cities and overcrowding do to people. You get out to a small town and everybody talks to everybody. Oh, you yes. smile at people as you pass them on the street. And that is so much healthier mentally, oh, emotionally, I could physically. I could tell you that. When I first moved up here from the lower mainland to where I am now, it took me about three weeks to realize that I didn't have to get angry at strangers coming up to me on the sidewalk saying, hi, how's your day going? That's right. And, and I, exactly. th I thought they were complete weirdos, man. Who does that? Who does Absolutely. that? Absolutely. You know, I live in Toronto, which has a subway system. Many cities do. The, you live in fear and terror that the person sitting next to you on the subway is going to strike up a conversation. Whereas if you're strolling around a street in a small town and somebody says, how are you doing? You stop. You have a little chat. You say, oh, you know, did you see that beautiful new uh, 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 garage door that so-and-so put in? Or have you been it's down true. to the beach lately? Or, yeah, it, it's so it much. Is, it's healthier. It is so true. You know, I, I mean, I'm laughing here. I mean, because a lot of people, I know this is so not paranormal right now, and I apologize to our audience for that. But I mean, it is so true. I mean, you, you know, I remember going into the grocery store here, and it, it, where I lived in the lower mainland, you didn't talk to the to the clerk because they had a job to do. And I remember getting pissed off one day because I got stuck behind one a, a group of couponers who are couponing oh, yes. everything. And, you know, yes, yes, Sunday yes. night, this was back in my single days, and Sunday night was usually single man or single father night at the grocery store. Right. Right. right? And so here I am with my $75 worth of groceries, and I'm having to battle Betty Coupons, you know, and her, her, yes. her 12 friends, because she's teaching her 12 friends how to coupon. And I was standing there for about an hour. I just about died. Just about, but yes. you, you know, you can't go outside for a cigarette because on the flip side, you're going to lose your place in line and then you're stuck again. And, you know, then right. You, absolutely. Then you can. I mean, now I, I don't yeah. approve of you going outside to smoke. It's bad for you. But the notion in a small town, uh, you know, of course, if you had to go, you, you had to go back to your car to get your wallet or something. Nobody's going to fight you when you want to get back to the place in line you had previously, if there's like any kind of line at all. Right. It's, of course, you're my neighbor, my friend. Uh, absolutely. You do the same for me. You mentioned this about the Mennonites. Right. That's the whole spirit of that community. Right. Right? Oh, of yeah. course, I'll do you, uh, you know, what Seinfeld would call a solid. I'll do you a favor. I'm there for you. And I, I, I don't even have to question whether you'd be there for me. It just goes without saying we're here for each other. Oh, That's yeah. the way human civilization should always be. Oh, yeah. I bought a riding lawnmower off a guy. I didn't have a trailer to tow it to my house. So he's like, mm -hmm. he's like, oh, well, just take mine. Bring it right back. And I'm looking, yes. I'm looking at this guy like he should be in the loony bin at this point because nobody just lends you a trailer. Right, right. You know, I mean, it, it was scary times all of a sudden. I didn't know what to do. Oh, I, we're, we're so... You mentioned the word paranoia in one of our earlier half-hour segments here. People are so terrified that somebody else is out to get them. That doesn't mean it's not true, right? Sometimes there are. We, you know, uh, here in Canada, there was a horrific murder in Red Deer by a patient of a doctor recently, just this past week, as I'm sure it made the national news and probably international news. Horrific. Uh, there are people who are out to get you and you have to be on guard all the time. But what a way to live your life. We know it, it causes the stress hormones, the adrenal gland running all the time on high alert is terrible for your mental and physical health. Oh, huge. And so much better to get to a place where you don't have to be running on red alert all the time. That's right. It, it's, it's like waiting for that heart attack or waiting That's right. or, or pushing your car to uh, the red line. You know, waiting for the engine to uh, finally give up. That's what exactly. we're doing. That's how exactly. we're living. It's terrible. Terrible.
How do we improve it? As we got about two and a half minutes to go, you know, from a sci sci-fi perspective, how do we improve what we're doing? Knowledge is number one. We first have to realize the mistakes we're making. And the biggest mistake I think is, and I alluded to this, is letting the online be a substitute for the real. And we're working every year, virtual reality gets more realistic. Our online experience gets higher bandwidth. Uh, this notion that the great way to spend your time is Netflix and chill, just turn your mind off and binge watch we're going to have a waking up and say, no, the way to spend your time is on quality interpersonal experiences, not on shutting out the rest of humanity. Well, we're going to find out. What's next for you, Robert? I'm working on a project now, which is about the reset switch being hit post-COVID-19, trying to put a roadmap out for us for what that hopefully utopian as opposed to dystopian future will be able to make out of the phoenix rising from the ashes of this current crisis that we're in today. Oh, isn't that nice? It must be nice to have that time to write a book. I've got two books underway. I haven't even come close to finishing a man. Haven't even come close. You know, I say to any beginning writer right now who's lost their job or isn't going to school because the school is closed, if you have been saying you want to be a writer and you aren't doing it, you know, God or the universe or however you want to define it has given you that chunk of free time that you said you needed and you were just – you know, uh, spinning a, a line of, uh, of, of, of bowl to yourself and everyone around you if you're not seizing that moment and taking advantage of it and actually doing the thing you said you were going to do if you got the gift of time. You got, you got the, it right now. You got that Seize right. Seize the day. Yes, Carp DM. Anyways, my friend, we've got 30 seconds. Let everybody know where they can find your books. The Oppenheimer Alternative is my most recent. It should be in bookstores everywhere. Probably find it in the science fiction section because it's an alternate history about the Manhattan Project. Uh, it's an ebook in every format at every ebook store. It's also an audio book at Audible and iTunes and everywhere else. And my website, I'm Robert J. Sawyer, but my website is SF writer.com s is in science f is in fiction writer.com my friend thank you so much for coming on spaced out radio an absolute pleasure to have you on the air with us robert and i look forward to you coming back i'd love to dave i enjoyed every minute perfect robert j sawyer everybody once again his website sfwriter.com coming up next we're going to go join the shift we're going to go straight across canada to talk some ufos we have the sor newswire and the thought of the dave lots more spaced up or spaced out radio coming up right after this my lips got stuck there i was like spaced up you got what <laughs> what anyways my friend what a pleasure it was honestly what a pleasure it was Thank you. I had a blast, too. I hope I did um, you justice. Oh, I, I, I was more than delighted with the questions and with the uh, the back and forth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank well, you. Well, we're going to give you a little uh, clap tell, here. Well, I appreciate that. And I'll tell Carmen that I had a fabulous time, too. So terrific. Uh, be well, my friend. Absolutely. And, uh, Anytime. and I hope your sister as well. Thank you. Anytime you want to come back, you just uh, uh, let Carmen know to get a hold of me, and we'll make time for you, my friend. I, I really enjoy I, this in your knowledge. Lovely. And uh, what a privilege. What an absolute privilege. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Excellent. my friend. Take care. I'm off to bed. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> Good night. Bye-bye. He was friggin' awesome. Corin's the booking guy. You outdid yourself with that one again. Let's give it a round of applause for Corin's the booking guy for another solid guest. This is all on him. Corin's the booking guy, everybody. Good job, Corin's. Honestly, another home run, my friend. Another home run. That was a lot of fun. Honestly, Corrin, you did amazing. Did amazing. Hey, there's Vancouver. 
Hey, Vancouver. Hey, Dave Scott, Spaced Out Radio. How you doing, my man? Good, brother. How you doing? Oh, pretty good, pretty good. Um, yeah, we just uh, uh, finished with this really weird story about this uh, farmer who dressed up as a woman and put a whole bunch of dead animals on his rival's grave. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, dude, dude. That's that's my kind of story, man. It's totally my yeah, kind of story. Yeah, happened in Arkansas. Oh, dude, where, where can I find that? I, I got to play this one. Where, 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 which site was it? Oh, it was, Arkansas... Dead animals. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was like Northwest Arkansas. Yeah. Was, oh, uh, there it is. Oh, NBC was oh dude, I am totally reading this once we get back. Don't don't give me any details. I, I'm reading this. This is amazing. This is perfect <laughs> for my show. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, you you'll uh, yeah. I, I, I had a feeling you would, you would love it. Oh yeah. Um. Yeah. So we're with with uh, Shane tonight and um is Shane getting yeah. the, is Shane um, getting the gig or what I don't know because he's not with us next week and um I don't know who, uh, who we've got next week actually to tell you the truth but uh yeah this should be an interesting uh week as far as developments go but uh so far yeah. he doesn't know uh and neither do we <laughs> I actually applied for it I'll be honest with you I applied and uh, and uh, um, what, oh, Larry said that uh, they were not interested in hi in hiring syndication from outside of chorus and it was going to go to somebody in chorus. Oh, somebody in chorus. Ah, interesting. Yeah. yeah, that's the tip I have. So we we lost out on it. We lost out on it. Uh, <laughs> hey, any updates on uh, the Penticton stuff? My sister got evacuated there. The fire. Um, we're we're having a look at it, but we've, we haven't got anything yet. Um, uh, we're about a minute away from coming back here yeah. as well. Yeah, I'm I'm ninety seconds. I'm ninety seconds. So uh, we'll join you in, th right, uh, in three minutes. Okay, sounds good, Dave. Uh, all right, hold tight. Okay, or a minute and a half, I guess. Three minutes. What am I thinking? Boy, my mathematics is off. Hey, Lufon, how you doing, buddy? Hey, burrito. To the limit. Your donation today will be matched dollar for dollar by the Canadian government to provide urgently needed. Gary, food, the spudger. I got. I gotta find that picture again, man. Did you send it to me on Twitter or or on Facebook? Or online at together.ca, the humanitarian coalition. Together, saving more lives. Worried about warts, pre-skin cancer, age spots, skin tags, spider veins, or skin lesions? Visit WhiteRockLaserClinic.com. Yeah, my sister is not fucking For going home. Consultation, call 604-535-8555 on George Street in White Rock. God, that looks close to her house. All right. We are about to join Vancouver here momentarily, everyone. All night conversation. This is The Shift. I'm Shane Hewitt here on The Shift, 877-399-9898. Your calls, your texts are welcome. It is uh, that time for us to connect with Spaced Out Radio and uh, find out what is going on with Dave Scott and the world of spacey Shops, my and amazing things. And uh, are we ready to connect with Dave or do we need another minute? Uh, let's, let's kill Video, you time. know, oh, little brother is here. 45 seconds. <laughs> All right. We could. Well, I'm busy trying to tweet this. I, I was trying to tweet out the picture of the guy um, who, uh, who did the animal thing. Um, there was one tweet that I, uh, one text message that came in that I did want to read out, and I'll do that. Um, about We've rounded third. We're heading for home tonight on Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. Thank you so much for joining us. want to remind you that if you missed most of this show or others, you can check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Just do me the favor. Hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to, Van, uh, to Bumblefoot and and reading up of, on uh, Captain Shirk's uh, SOR Newswire and, um, on was, Twitter. It, Follow it, it us at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. Now we're that, going to end up going what, over to uh, Vancouver. Joining up with Shane and the shift, we're going to get into some that's UFOs that's here. Probably a thing so we're just waiting for them because that's kind of what we do um, around here. 
It also, if anything's going to happen... Let's see what's going to go on. COVID, Ready to talk to some out, UFOs. I didn't really get into UFOs like too much tonight, but we're going to. It's going to be someone has tries to sneak We're going to get into some UFO, for UFOs. Because we got to talk about this. And um, to see what's going on. I mean, lots happening south like of the border, border, but north of the border, not much when it comes to the old aliens. we got to figure that out. 877-399-9898. All right, we are going to be joining Vancouver here momentarily. Shane and the shift. You can do whatever you want. So we're going to do this thing, man. We are totally going to have some fun here as we do it every once a week. Hey, everyone. How are you? We're wonderful, Dave Scott, Spaced Out Radio. How are you? I am good. I'm a, I'm a little worried right now because my sister and her husband were evacuated at 3 o'clock from uh, Penticton. And so I'm a little worried about the whole forest fire situation there because three years ago, where I live in a 108-mile ranch, British Columbia, I was evacuated. And it is a scary, scary feeling. If you've never been evacuated due to a forest fire or a natural disaster, trust me, you don't ever want to go through that. So it, it's a little uh, nerve-wracking right now, but you know what? We can still talk some aliens. Uh, yeah, well, BC forest fires, for that being said, I mean, have drastically changed in the last uh, hours, if not a um, couple of days, for sure. So we'll keep an eye on that one for sure. Aliens. Okay. Um, is there a particular place that you wanted to go today, Dave Scott? I have a texture with a question that could get us started unless you had well, it. No, let's take the question. If you got an audience question, I'd love to hear it. I think it's a valid question. All I right. don't think it's a tongue-in-cheek question. All right. Um, it says, Shane, can you ask Dave Scott if there's any new sightings of the men in black? And I think that that's a, um, you know, I think it's an interesting question. I've had similar questions be asked of me before in regards to our conversations in that. The, the theory being is that if there are um, aliens around us all the time that we maybe not know about, uh, is it very possible that there are a men in black, if you will, that are fighting these aliens or controlling these aliens or keeping them Ooh, out of public that, eye? That's a good question. A little bit Hollywood style in the reference, mind you. But um, is it possible that there's the, you know, the alien police that are keeping them at bay? You know what? Men in black encounters really have gone down over the last couple of years. And like I like to say to people, and I got no proof of this, but I honestly believe that Luis Elizondo who is of the To The Stars Academy, he used to run a program called ATIP, which is the Advanced Aerial Threat... I forget what the IP stands for right now. But there are many people in the field of ufology who believe that he is actually a man in black who's come out publicly. He'll never admit it, you know? But, I mean, then there's the big debate. Are men in black actually human, like we saw in the movies, playing with aliens? Or... Are they of some sort of extraterrestrial descent? I mean, there's that famous tape out of uh, Niagara Falls, out of a hotel from a number of years ago, where a gentleman had s said that he was uh, had reported in that he was seeing UFOs around Niagara Falls. And uh, within a couple weeks, he had these two men in black show up at the office. There's a video of it. You could go on, on YouTube and check it on out. And these strange, tall, bald creatures that didn't look to have eyebrows or ears but they were wearing the black fedoras and full black clothes, very pale white skin, kept on asking for them. And they didn't seem to understand that when his employees were telling him that it was his day off, they weren't accepting that. And it took a while before they finally got up and left. And yet they never came back, which is very strange. Very strange. So are they human? They could be. Could they also be extraterrestrial? That is one of the mysteries around the men in black as well. Hmm. Do you think that it would be extraterrestrial, or do you think that it would be one of those things that it's the humans and the government that sort of keeps from us? Me? I think it's more governmental. I don't think it's alien at all, but that's just me. You know, that's just me, because... I think that, you know, there's a lot of people out there who want to know what is going on. There's a lot of people out there up until recently that were wanting secrets to be kept, that they were wanting to shut up the loud mouths. I mean, there's a famous picture from, I believe, the late 60s, early 70s by Timothy Beckley, who actually caught a picture of a man in black that was doing an investigation 
I believe he was being followed at that time. And so it's very interesting to see where this goes, because as with social media and as we are starting now through the United States government in trying to understand that this UFO phenomena is actually very real, it's amazing. And we just asked this last week on the show, how the men in black seem to be almost disappearing. You don't hear many of their stories anymore or sightings anymore. Maybe it's a retired program. So I think of it this way. Yeah, I, I, I think of it this way. Um, if it's an inter-terrestrial inter, uh, sort of men in black being, I mean, that, okay, excuse the Hollywood, but it's a reference point that we all understand. Sure. Um, you kind of get into a Transformers scenario that there would be a policing body or somebody that's stepping in because maybe somebody's up to no good. And it doesn't really seem to be a whole lot of that going on, right? Like this whole, the behavior issue, it seems to be more of a, a containment issue than it would be a, a behavior issue. And that would lead me to believe that it wouldn't be two different international bodies policing each other, right? Well, and, and I, th- I, th- I think you're going along the same lines there as, you know, in the right lines. You know, the big thing that we need to also understand, too, as UFOs are now becoming part of a real prevalent part of the news reel, especially in the United States, not here in Canada. OK, but in the United States, where where they are taking this topic very, very seriously, they're about to get funding on a new program that was just announced. OK, they are moving very, very swiftly. But if you notice, nobody is asking about the history. The, the furthest they are going back is the 2004 USS Nimitz encounter, which many UFO historians and researchers are calling now the modern day Roswell. Yet nobody is asking because you and I have talked about this kind of a sore point for me away about the way the mainstream media has covered this topic. All right. But if you look at it, no reporter is asking about what happened at Roswell. No reporter is asking what happened on, uh, what was it, March 13th, 1997, when the Phoenix Lights happened. And I just happen to be wearing my Phoenix Lights T-shirt right now, too. I know you can't see it, but it, it is pretty cool. Mm. And, you know, nobody is asking about the history of, of these reports. Everybody is focused on what is going on. And, uh, you know, this story is is becoming mainstream in the U.S. And for people in Canada here, we're not worried about that. We're worried about Bill Morneau resigning as finance minister. We're worried about the we transfer scandal, the things that we need to be worried about. We're worried about the budget. We're worried about COVID. We're worried about everything. And yet this story is just slipping right under the noses of everyone, especially the media. Hmm. On purpose, do you think? Yeah. Yeah. You think our government does that on purpose? Good no, no, no. It's because we have a mainstream media that has always made fun of this topic. Outside, now think about it. You take away the one big show that is kind of broadcast around Canada. You take away our little segment. There are very few people in Canada discussing what we are discussing right now. And there are even fewer newsrooms. There are fewer newsrooms who are actually covering this topic. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I, I feel like I need to defend that um, in part way because there are some shows that talk about it from a perspective of digging into it. And some shows will flippantly go into all conspiracy theories without filter. True. um, And allow any conspiracy theory um, to be a part of the conversation when some of them are, are are blatant misleading stories. I think that that's what takes away from this conversation. Absolutely. Because of the fact that there are serious conversations to be had. There are serious stories to be able to say, look, this was my experience. For example, I have a texture right here. That says, way back in my youth in the 80s, my dad worked on investigating UFO claims. We always had weird clicking in our phone. Um, all of our mail came pre-opened. Mm-hmm. And um, sorry, got to open up the text here to go further. And uh, old black cars seemed to circle our block. Nate from Cleveland. Oh, he just called in. Hey, Nate. Um, so, you know, I mean, so the stories of a, a guy like Nate who has that experience, mm-hmm. they often get diluted or diffused by sure. some of the other reckless inclusion of some conspiracy theories. Absolutely. So, you know, in defense of keeping it balanced, I think that, that we got we gotta make sure that we also stay on the same page about what is 
uh, a legitimate share versus what is mm-hmm. trying to inflame things. No, and you're exactly right. And, and even so. with our own show, even though we deal with a lot of the weird and strange, there are topics on this show that I am not covering because I won't go down that conspiratorial road. It's dangerous. There's not a lot of information. And you have to be accurate. You can't just you know fly off the seat of the handle just because a friend of a friend of a friend told you that. That's not it's not right. People, you, you know, you can get yourself in a lot of trouble. And we've seen that with certain topics with, you know, especially YouTube banning uh, people like Dr. James Fetzer, Dr., uh, David Icke, people like that who have spewed a, a lot of garbage out there, you know, and, and dangerous, dangerous mm-hmm. material. And you got to You walk a fine line, you know, but when it comes to UFOs, don't you find it ironic? And I'll, I'll pose this question to you and even your audience, don't you find it ironic that the Canadian media will cover stories about these UFO events, but not a single or very few reporters have even bridged this subject with anybody in Ottawa? Yeah, it's hard to investigate, um, but no one's asking the question. Uh, Another texture says, Dave, I work in Alberta rural newspaper. We covered cattle mutilation years back. Uh, yes, it's speech to text because it actually said I worked in Alberta rural newspaper. <laughs> um, so, I mean, you know, there are old stories that are there. Absolutely. That's for sure. Another Texas Desmond in Black are real. And there was a question for you, Dave, if I may. Please. Says, Can you ask Dave about how aliens travel? He's heard about intergalactic portals through black holes and the like. Oh, yes. I mean, this is a fun topic. I think, and I have no experience on this, but in talking to people who have who claim they have traveled on UFO craft, they, they almost say they're, they're like wormholes. That's how they are getting here. They're able to bend space and time to travel multi-light years ahead by jumping through these these wormholes that they've been able to they've been able to create how they're doing it i have no idea all right but there are people who's who who have claimed this they say it almost looks like you know in star trek when they're gonna go into hyperspeed and all of a sudden all the stars end up looking like a big white tunnel that's what they say is happening and it's it's kind of weird, man, because if that is happening, that's a little too close for, you know, sci-fi to be able to nail that one out. That's for sure. I mean, it would be a lot easier to just sort of drive through the the hula hoop and end up where you're going. I exactly. mean, that would be certainly convenient, wouldn't it? Well, we would hope so. We'd hope so. But like I mean, that also opens up a lot of questions in regards to something that, uh, you know, a number of researchers are now getting back into, because the one thing about the field of ufology is what is old is new again. And believe it or not, I believe today is the 25th anniversary of the alien autopsy video being released to the public. It ended up being proven a hoax, but now there are scientists in the background saying, well, maybe it just wasn't a hoax and playing that game. So for people who have never seen that, it's there was a there was like a 1990s special on this. I believe it was, it was on Fox or something along those lines about this alien autopsy video where it was allegedly supposed to be of one of these alien greys that was recovered from the Roswell crash, I believe. And I know my audience will, in my chat rooms, will uh, literally light me up if I got that wrong. So I might be able to correct it if I am wrong. And they were doing the autopsy on this, like pulling the the black covers over the eyes to show human-like eyeballs, you know, and the black lenses were more like sunglasses built in. All right. We, we've seen all of this. And, and, you know, that's one of those videos where, you know, in the field of ufology, you know, what's old is new again. The other one that's coming up is is portals and jump rooms on whether or not we actually have some sort of time travel technology that is out there right now, you know, where you can, you know, take a jump room. If you want to go from New Mexico to New Jersey, you just take a jump room in between these buildings and you're there within seconds. 
you know, and they're they're debating whether or not that's happening. And that's how we're getting people up to the moon and Mars. I mean, years ago, there was a gentleman named Andrew Bashago, you know, a lawyer out of Washington state who claims to be a child chrononaut that the United States government had these these children back in the day that included Barack Obama when he was known as Barry Satoro, you know, going through these jump rooms from Mars to back in time to, you know, seeing the Gettysburg Address and all of this weird stuff. I mean, it's so hard to believe, okay? But there are people now investigating. And in fact, I had someone send me pictures of one of these alleged jump room buildings where these are being stored and these things are being happened. I got those pictures a, a, a few weeks ago. And can I confirm it? No, not at all. Do I want to believe in it? Oh, hell yes, I do. Amazing stuff. Dave Scott, spaceoutradio.com. You can check out the, the Twitter feed is a really great way to keep in touch. I love that and find out what's going on on uh, the podcast, the program, the live show, the Absolutely, all the other conversation man. in the chat room. Thank you. That's happening too. Uh, yeah. Dave Scott, thanks so much for the time, buddy. I appreciate it. It's nice all, to hear your voice. All the time for you, my friend, and take care, and uh, we'll talk next week. Good night. Yeah, wish your best to your uh, to your sister there in Penticton for me, okay? I could do that. Thank you, Shane. Take care. Appreciate it. Bye bye. All right, Dave Scott. Bye bye. All right, you too. All right, let's get to it now, shall we? Because it is that time. The news is always changing, which is why we bring you the SOR Newswire at the back end of every show, where we get to the weird, the strange, the wacky, and sometimes the giant question mark. Now, this one is not on Shirky Poo's newscast yet. We're going to get it over to her because I know she's listening, but I got tipped off to this one by Vancouver, so I quickly pulled it up. An Arkansas farmer was arrested last week for allegedly defacing the grave of his former neighbor who he hated. With the blood of dead animals, he repeatedly left on the headstone. 78-year-old Joseph Stroud, obviously a very good candidate for anger management, is accused of dressing up disguised as a woman to leave the carcasses at the resting place of his longtime nemesis, Fred McKinney. Oh, poor Fred. Poor, poor Fred. How do you do this? Who comes up with this idea? (coughs) Anyways. So this is what happened. McKinney's granddaughter, Shannon Nobles, first noticed the dead animals back in May. At least one of them left a brown stain on McKinney's head. One occasion, after Stroud drove away, Nobles found a dead possum and eight live babies at her grandfather's grave. After the incident, police responded to Stroud's home and found a bath towel with apparent blood stains in the back seat of Stroud's car. Stroud has denied the accusations. He's been charged with defacing objects of public respect. Okay. (laughs) Is that not just the weirdest thing? Who does this? Who does this? I I mean, uh, how do you continue on with that? Only in Arkansas or Florida. Thought of the day happens every night at this time, where we ask a question on our Facebook and Twitter pages, then read your responses on the air because we love the audience participation around here. Today's thought of the day is as follows. What's your weirdest encounter with a ghost, UFO, alien, or cryptid creature? Debbie. I've seen my dad full-bodied after he passed away, and many others I have no clue who they were. I talk to spirits currently for ones freely here in my Facebook group. I have seen over 20 UFOs in my lifetime, one tree level. I had a gray in my house several months ago that my daughter saw. I had a scarf apported by my deceased mother. I have seen firsthand up close levitation of humans, then disappearing, teleportation in plain sight, telekinesis, mind reading, astral projection, which I can do most mention. Oh my goodness, Debbie, we're going to have to talk. Robin, I was at University Heights Elementary in the fan room and there's a dark entity when I went into one of my favorite spots. It has air ducts above. I asked how many are there and I got four loud bangs on the air duct above me. Oh, that's scary. We got time for one more here. 
or maybe two. Jack, seeing a ghost on a friend's security camera footage. David, just being taken, then scratched by something unseen and having to take it back. That is to everybody, the news and the thought of the Dave, the shortened version, because we joined the shift with Shane out of Vancouver, which we do once a week. Absolutely love doing that. So thank you to everybody participating in the thought of the day. We'll do it all again tomorrow. Thank you, Captain Shirk, for the news. And, of course, to Robert J. Sawyer being our guest tonight. We got Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thaw rocking in the background with Little Brothers watching. Bumblefoot is the official music of Spaced Out Radio, rocking us in and out of every single show. Get your horns up for the guitar god himself. Special thanks to everybody participating by listening at home, in your cars, at work, wherever you may be. Thank you to everyone in our chat rooms on Spreaker, YouTube, LGAB, Rev Radio, Facebook, the Space Travelers Club, and our website. And of course, to all the Starkers and Snarkheads hanging out on Twitter at hashtag Spaced Out Radio. We all had a good time tonight. Excuse me. Remember, this show is copyright by Spaced Out Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thank you so much for choosing to share your evening with us, because together, my friends, say it with me, we own the night. Mr. Bumblefoot, we need a favor. We need you to take us home. The Wu train has parked for the night, but tomorrow, my friends, we shall ride again. Your seats are always available. Your tickets never expire. And if you want to bring a friend, guess what? We have room for them, too. Good night. Solid radio there tonight, people. Solid radio tonight. Give yourselves a hand. That's good stuff right there, people. Good stuff right there. That's really good. Really, really good stuff there tonight. My man Quest taking us home with me. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, that feels good. Woo! My ears can breathe. Hi, redheaded Lisa. Oh, yeah. <coughs> do, 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 do. Mm hmm. This is good stuff tonight, man. Good stuff tonight. Pharmacy, what was your show on? Do, 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 do. All right, this is downloading. I'm going to be right back. All right, I just got to call my sister, so I'll be right back. <coughs>
All right, I am back. I am back. Let's show all. Go here. Move all of these over. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, let's uh, do a little bit of editing here, shall we? Hey, third phase. Um <clears throat> YouTube uh, shut down my Super Chat and my AdSense because of a PIN code that I'm now waiting to come in the mail. I was actually going to contact you guys about that. So I think we got it all straightened out. Now we're waiting for a PIN code. Yeah, so I don't know if I could get one straight through YouTube and call them up and kind of gripe about that or not, but uh, <clears throat> I don't know. I don't know YouTube that well. Oh, Dave's far from a wizard, man. <clears throat> Dave is far from a wizard.
I don't know why it's all of a sudden buffering tonight. YouTube is not receiving enough video to maintain. Fuck, we've had the same video through the entire night. Entire night. Doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Any sense. Must be a YouTube issue. <clears throat> I don't get it. I wish the buffering would just make up its friggin' mind. Drives me nuts. Are you guys, uh, third phase, are you guys noticing a lot of buffering, too? On your ends? When you go live? Yeah, no kidding. <clears throat> that sucks. Hey, Cherie, how are you?
No, Doug hasn't been in here the last number of nights. He doesn't want to hang out. Okay, Cherie. Uh, I'm I'm available in about 15 minutes if you are. <clears throat> Let me know if that works for you. When you live premiere, we don't do live most of the time because... Yeah, I can see that. So I've got a new music kick right now. It's the band Avatar. They're a hard rock slash heavy metal type group. They're pretty awesome. Hey, Ron, just so you know, I'm actually working here. So when I'm quiet, I uh, it's because I'm actually working. <clears throat> oh goodness i forgot to do this upload folder what am i thinking upload let's get this thing going thank you paul and good morning to you Yeah, Cherie, uh, send me a message on Facebook Messenger with your phone number, and then I'll call you. Chuckles. Dave's been looking more stressed. Anyone see it? I do. I do. That's a very astute comment there, Chuckles. Where's your beehive picture? <clears throat> Can't sleep, man. No time. You have to have time to have luxuries like sleep. What is sleep? Zero two zero six five nine zero two zero six five nine is your verification code. <clears throat> Hmm. 
Dave has a German Shepherd. And Dave has a German Shepherd cross. All right, that's one done. <clears throat> uh, weekends, I've been doing a lot of sleeping. I've been uh, actually going to bed oh, excuse me, before midnight. <clears throat> Usually around 10.30, 11 30, I'll go to bed on Saturday and Sunday night. So I'm trying to make that more routine to catch up on some sleep. I still hate the new Facebook look. Trying to get used to it. Not working for me. Yeah, I couldn't uh, keep Steve Istall's uh, uh, swearing down to a minimum. That kind of sucked. But that's okay. He's a good dude. Smart dude. <clears throat> Thank you, Paul. Really appreciate that. See where we are here. I am done. Done like that. 
All right. <clears throat> I'm going to call it the night, everyone. I'm going to call it the night because I do have to go get some uh, sleep and I got a busy day tomorrow morning to make things happen. Um, so let's just uh, do that and we'll call it the evening and uh, see you tomorrow. Bye. Oh, I forgot to tell you who's on tomorrow. We got Merle. Merle and the ladies from BC 